Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. How are you? My name is Bernie. I'm the director here with the Linen Hall, and I'd like to warmly welcome you here this afternoon. Thanks so much for coming. We always feel so blessed to see so many people here out in support of the arts in Mayo. This event is moderated by Kate Strain, but I'm just going to say a few brief words before we begin and include some light housekeeping. I'd like to make a special note of how delighted we are to have uh, Neve O'Malley back with us today. We are... We are so proud as a county to have one of Mayo's finest represent Ireland at the Venice Biennale, and Neve always has a special place in our hearts as she has also curated a contemporary survey of Mayo for the Mayo Collaborative back in 2013. This was a unique exhibition which featured Neve's work in five venues around Mayo simultaneously. She also kindly loaned us two pieces for the Mayo Artist Show in 2021 in partnership with Ballina Art Centre. There will always be a special place at the Linen Hall for Neve, and I've no doubt that we'll have plenty of opportunities to work together again in the future. I'm just back from a year's leave, and when I first heard that we would be part of the Irish tour at Venice, my first thought is I will go home, pack my bags, and do a trip around Italy. But it was all the sweeter to find out that Venice was coming to the Linen Hall instead of the other way around. We feel absolutely privileged to be part of the Irish Tour of Ireland at Venice, and have had an interesting few months working with the brilliant teams at Temple Bar Studios and Gallery and the Models Sligo. This event is the final marker of the extraordinary work of Kleena and Michael over the past few years, and it's been a real honour to offer our support and work with them on this closing event. Before I finish up, I'd like to thank our funders for their ongoing support, without which we would not be in a position to host this event. Thank you to the Arts Council and Castlebar Municipal District, and of course to the brilliant team in Mayo Arts Office, Anne-Marie, Katrina, Orla and Aoife, who not only give their support financially, but also collaborate with us on a number of events throughout the year and offer their support in numerous ways. If you haven't done so already, please remember to uh, put your phones on silent. We are active on social media and we encourage you to take photos during the event, but please be mindful of anybody who's sitting behind you. Please share and spread the word about the event and you can tag any of the groups here today and you can use the hashtags Ireland at Venice, Irish Tour or Neve O'Malley. And please note that the event is currently being live streamed also. In the unlikely event that the fire alarm goes off, please remain calm and just follow a staff member out of the building either through this door or this door. In the un or sorry, um, we will have a short interval at 3.50 for 15 minutes. Um, please aim to be back in your seats for five past four and for the second half of the event. The coffee shop will be open and there will also be teas and coffees in the foyer. Um, so you will have time to grab a quick refreshment before coming back into your seats. Uh, don't forget also that we will have a reception afterwards at 5.30 in our foyer. Um, you can enjoy a Venetian spritz and have a bite to eat. We will, there's be plenty of food for thought during the afternoon, so there'll be plenty to talk about afterwards and you'll get to meet the speakers here as well. Um, just a final note, we did launch um, an exquisite exhibition yesterday. Um, it's upstairs in our gallery. It's called A Common Thread by Camilla Hanney. And you're more than welcome to have a wander upstairs after the event and look at her work. Um, that is it for me. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful afternoon. So I'm speaking here today to say that there aren't words for everything, or at least I can't seem to find them. Instead, over the past two years, I've produced a series of silent but tangible objects, artworks, but that's almost a side story. Over the past almost three years, I've also been invited to speak, to pitch, propose, promote, and publicize. I've been asked, what will you do? What will it look like? How will you begin? Why will it matter? Who are you, anyway? But how do you describe something before it exists? that by its nature is born outside of language? And can I be the one to observe and dictate what prompts my attention, my notice, my affinity towards a particular material or form? It seems to me that to know intent or to try to speak it contradicts the act of finding the work, which is the act of making. If you'd visited my studio recently, you'd have seen stacks of vertical steel posts, some narrow, shallow steel trays, 
Numerous templates and shapes cut from card, paper, and wood, resting in early compositions on shelves, on walls, and on the ground. There are drawings, a few technical, most less so, some painted panels, scribbled phrases and reminders, littering the too small desk. There's a shaped and polished slab of hardwood, a folded screen of reeded glass, a series of delicate rectilinear shapes balanced on a thin strip of steel, bent by hand and held by its own tension in the studio wall. Slivers of colored and textured glass shaped, cut, sanded and wrapped in copper foil. They are soldered and patinaed and balanced on the head of a nail. They hold the light against the wall. A set of polished beach shapes resembling typographic parentheses are too tall to stand, so they have to lie on some foam padding, waiting to hold the contents of the exhibition and the gallery itself within their brackets. Things seem to be an effort to anchor and contain. Stones laid, glass cut, wood stained, hung, arranged, composed, sat, lain, stood, cornered. Handmade is only relevant in terms of hand thought. There's a rationality in forms, found or fashioned. Trees speak, mountains speak, and objects speak. Maybe making work is a chase, an effort at capture, at pinning things down. I made a video of Nathan, a mountain very close to here for those of you who don't know, a few years ago. I grew up in front of it, but who's to say that's the front? Like every good mountain, it defines the entire landscape around it and we understand where we are in relation to it. In my video, the road becomes a track for the camera. Nathan, the subject, is drained of sound and of color. There's a small black mark on a sheet of glass positioned in front of the camera lens. And the work, in part, is an effort to keep that mark on the mountain, to keep the attention on the mountain despite the wipes of hedges and twisting roads, to try and see it. There's a sadness in the flattening and an absurdity in the chasing, something so utterly solid, monumental and still. The mark on the glass and on the mountain is mine, or yours, a finger pointing as well as getting in the way. I live in Dublin these days and we have a tiny urban garden bound by the high wall of the railway which runs over our heads and rattles our cups. Visitors often start at the rumble, yet we barely notice. You get used to things. Could any of us have coped over the past few strange years if we noticed everything? It seems at points that the whole situation was too much, too new, too wrong. But things always, necessarily perhaps, appear to move from the exceptional to the everyday. Yes, in the last couple of years of looping time and lost moments, we've been grateful to be on home ground. A place constructed, however briefly, of our familiar things and habits. During the most intensely isolated times, we went further to ground. We bedded in, tended to the corners, objects and surfaces. It was remarkably quiet. A time of a weighty hush where it has seemed little could be said or done. In one particular protracted interlude, there were less trains. Interestingly, we noticed their absence. And the sun shone more than usual. The garden's minuscule beings were noticeably busy hefting earth and food, and we spent days outside watching the patch work its own ground. Sometimes we lay on it. It was a small community of reciprocal gazes. Could such silence be a place of power? We definitely needed to do something, anything, so we began digging a hole. A morbid or a constructive act? We wondered if this strange hush could be met head on with a spade. We tend to notice labor only when we work ourselves, and it turns out there is a significant amount of labor involved in digging a hole. It's a very productive as well as a destructive act. We displaced a disproportionately large mound of soil containing a wealth of inner city treasure. We unearthed shards of pottery, glass, and twisted metal and laid them out to dry. A pile of messy material that had been touched by many hands. There was a delight and a comfort in this. Once something connects with the scale of the human body and its effort, maybe there's a kind of a joining, a small sense of proportion and relief. What does it mean to reckon with the thing in front of you, which is never just the thing in front of you? The ground became more impermeable as we dug. 
the pit became more solid. We plugged its gaps, we sealed and molded its edges, and we took care. Eventually, we filled the hollow with water, and over the next few weeks and months, the birds and the insects all came. We'd constructed a lure, a beacon for washing and drinking. A space to quench had been revealed, a simple garden pond. I fixated on an adolescent hooded crow that visited daily for a while. He needed to raise his head so the stagnant water could trickle down his throat. His body bowed towards the water and then rose rhythmically towards the sky in order to sate his thirst. I worried that the enclosed space was too tight for him to take flight as he clumsily hopped from pot to hedge to air. He needs to know the edges of things. The digging reminded me of the power of placemaking, of relocating ourselves, of touching and of gathering. And although the things that I have made over the past few years sit calmly and silently in their present form, many of the materials, the wood, steel, glass and stone used, have a latent energy. They're formed of years of growth, of geological time, of immense compression or violent tooling, flaming, drilling and molten heat. What I did end up making, it seems, are exhibitions constructed of shelters, vents, drains, hooks, and shelves. These objects hint at familiar architectural structures and physical support systems, like the bockety breathing vent. They gesture towards enabling, offering protection, conveying sensations of touch and more, of grabbing, holding, caressing surfaces, moments of tether, I hope that we, in our frantic, moving, complicated selves, might just take some time to pause and breathe and encounter and query their presence or their point. For me, they're the texture of distance, the price of sight. Thank you so much. Neve O'Malley, for anybody who hasn't guessed. Thank you, Neve. These words are beautiful and I think an incredibly poignant and grounding way to start today as we enter into a kind of otherworldly experience of the Venice that happened in Venice and now tours around Ireland. My name is Kate Strain. I'm the director of Kunstverein Ockram and formerly the artistic director of Grazer Kunstverein, which is where I first met Neve, really and invited her to show an exhibition of her work in 2018, five years from today. Um, Neve was born here in Castlebar and grew up in Mayo, as she says, in front of the mountain. Neve now lives and works in Dublin in Temple Bar Gallery and Studios, where her studio is. And she's now an international artist of wide renown, having shown at so many brilliant venues and galleries and institutions. It's my absolute pleasure to accompany you today on this journey through Venice as we gather and speak with each other in the moment, live, in the flesh, even though there was a time in my life and probably within all of yours when we didn't know if that was ever going to be possible again. So here we are. We'll take a breath and we'll be very happy that we're all here today. I followed Neve's work with great interest ever since she showed at the Grazer Kunstverein in 2018, and met the challenges of Venice, the machine, La Biennale di Venezia. It's the world's longest running exhibition of its kind. It's absolutely internationally renowned and acclaimed, and it's the pinnacle of, the, of many artists' careers. Of course, Venice wouldn't be possible without an amazing team behind you, so it's wonderful that we're welcoming Temple Bar Gallery and Studios Kalina Shaffrey, the director, and Michael Hill, the programme curator, to the table for, speak for speaking and talking as well today. We're delighted about that. Where I stand right now, I'm 2,126 kilometres from where Neve's exhibition was in Venice. It was in a room at the end of a long corridor in the middle of the Arsenale. Venice has been going on from 1895. These exhibitions have happened, the arts ones, every second year. And with a little bit of jostling around due to COVID and other things, they are a highlight in every curator's calendar and any professional artist really wants to go to Venice. 
Sadly, 2022 was one of the first iterations of Venice that I missed. So I feel like I'm in the same boat as a lot of you here today, having not seen the physical exhibition in the flesh. Luckily, it was documented by a wonderful photographer uh, called Russ Kavanagh, and we're about to see footage of that documentation now. After that, we'll move to a panel discussion, and after that, we'll move to an interval. So without any further ado, I'm going to sit down and we'll watch Russ Kavanagh's film unfold. Thank you. We're going to begin our first panel of today, and I'd like to invite Kleena and Michael and Neve to join me up here. So in our preparation for today's event, we talked about what we wanted to communicate today and what we wanted to get across, and the kind of insight we wanted to share with you about the journey and the process and the amazing feat and accomplishment that is the Venice Biennale and Ireland at Venice. And one of the things we realised in our discussions was that throughout the whole process, at every stage and every step, there were no shortcuts. And so we call this panel today, No Shortcuts. <laughs> um, I have some questions that I'd love to ask you, uh, and I, we'd also love to open up to questions from the floor whenever that feels comfortable. But maybe I could start, Kleena and Michael, I'd love to ask you about your first ever encounter with artwork by Neve O'Malley. Do you want to go, Michael? Sure. <laughs> um, I'm very fortunate because my first encounter with Neve's work happened to be in Temple Bar Gallery and Studios, where we, Kleena and I work. Um, but it was probably about 12 years ago, and um, Neve was working in a different studio than we've all been spending a lot of time in over the past couple of years. And she was preparing a video work of um, the island piece uh, filmed at Loch Derg. And um, a few years following that, I had the great um, privilege of working with Neve on a major big exhibition with the Nathan film as well in the Douglas Hyde Gallery in Dublin. So I've been a fortunately long working relationship with Neve now for eight or nine years or something like that. Yeah. Okay, so it's lovely to be here in the Linen Hall. 
and thank you very much for all being here as well. I can say that. I, <clears throat> the first time I um, came across Neve's work, Neve was neither there and nor was her work. It was in a charrette uh, that was organised with uh, Christine Mackey and it was in the Devil's Glen in Wicklow and it was a kind of a forum discussing landscape, art, sculpture and the possibilities for sculpture in the landscape. So uh, that was kind of like uh, throughout that day, Neve's, Neve was invited as a participant but couldn't be there. And throughout that day, her work got uh, spoken about and, um, and actually more than once. And I remember being quite curious about this artist, even though I had, no, no, n I had never heard of her before, um, except that she was going to come. So when I first uh, encountered the work for The Real, it was the work you were making of um, the projections onto the paintings. And I think it might have been, um, it could have been in the Green and Red Gallery. It was the, you know, maybe 2008 or nine or something. And it was a, a scene of, the projection was onto the painting and it was a scene of a park, which I know is Central Park in, in, in New York. And the 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 on on the on the on this on the image projected, figures moved in and out and around the the park slowly, but the whole image was fixed. And at some point into it, the lights came down. The the and the and dimmed and slowly stopped. The projection stopped and the canvas painting was just there exposed for what it was and it was less than what was the was the actual the actual image we were looking at before so there was this revelation of what actually was happening the painting was the painting the projection had stopped and it was then it just picked up again and it uh, started all over again the illusion broken and began again but I wanted to say to this was that even though Neve has gone into, as we've seen and as she's spoken so beautifully about their um, solid form, sculptural work, uh, there were things in that early work that we, we followed the thread back that I suppose have always been there in her work in, in, my, in my mind. Like I suppose that, I, that idea of this in-between space of something at moment fixed with something like a fluid movement and then also, I suppose, that thing of uh, um, overlay and then the idea of something being um, revealed for what it is in, in itself. I love how you describe that. And it sounds very similar to your first experience of Neve as a person, as an artist, this elusive ghost yes. <laughs> and how something is revealed and pulled back. And the way you talk about her as a, a breaker of illusions. Mm. I think that's something you do in your work a lot, Neve. You reveal and break an illusion or look at, look through, look with. And I think so much of your work is about looking. So those moments of first encounter with the work are very special. Yes. Uh, I, I imagine for some people here today, the first moment of encounter with Neve's work could have been in Sligo at the model or could have been in Dublin in Temple Bar Gallery and Studios. Or maybe even, for some of you, it could be right now. Is that, is that a possibility? Has anyone here not encountered Neve's work in the flesh? Great. Well, we have some. That's really nice, because this is now a, a first encounter, I suppose, which is, in a way, something very exciting. Um, so you'd encountered Neve's work. You'd seen it, and you got a sense of what she was about. And I think, Neve, when you spoke at the beginning, you really drew us into your approach, your approach to making, your approach to artistic thinking. But what on God's earth compelled the three of you <laughs> to work together and decide to pitch and run for Venice and do this huge project? What was the moment that you decided to go for it? 
It's, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, in, in Ireland, I mean, different countries run the way they do Venice differently, I suppose. <laughs> and in Ireland, there is one amazing thing in that it's open to everybody. It's open to anybody. So it's quite normal as the sort of, you know, the year the years roll around and it's, a, it's about to, you know, the Culture Ireland are about to do a call out again that you'll get people kind of talking and going, oh, would you or would you consider it? And I mean, over the years I have pitched <laughs> unsuccessfully <laughs> and um, but I, I talked to previous people who'd done it and they kind of kept emphasizing the importance of the team and who you would work with and that it was it's a long kind of quite tough gig as well and that you have to be with people that you would really respect and that you would enjoy working with and for me it seemed really obvious that Cleana and Michael would be amazing and I was in the studios so I sort of said it one one day to Cleana on the stairs and kind of went you know what do you think and she said let me think about it let me think about it and because uh, I know she wouldn't say yes unless she was going to do it properly you know so that was that was like that was the autumn of 2019 so it's quite a while ago, and we knew that the call-out would come in January and they'd give you a few weeks, so you'd have to be kind of already thinking about it. And we were, so we were, so, yeah, early 2020, we had a kind of pitch together, you know, the first stage proposal together. And I remember we were supposed to have, the interviews had been timetabled for April the 3rd, which ended up, obviously, everything got cancelled because it was COVID. So we ended up, um, we knew we were shortlisted and the interviews didn't happen until, the, until September. But we ended up having this quite strange time during that really intense COVID period where we kind of rethought things a bit and we became a kind of a bubble in the, in the studios because very few people were going to the studios. So we would go and we would actually meet in person at a distance in my lovely, quite large studio, which I'm moving out of soon and I will miss. Um, and we would sit like, you know, kind of far apart and like discuss this. And in a way, there was a lull in the program for you guys. And there was a kind of all of so much was put on hold that we had this moment of kind of speculation and imagining things. And, you know, that, that maybe we wouldn't have had otherwise, you know, that we were able to kind of think, well, let's just think about this thing that could happen, you know. So eventually the interviews happened in... Yeah, sept late September, and we found out in October yeah, of 2020. Yeah. I love that it all began with a moment in passing on the stairs. Yeah. Would we think about this? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing can only happen in an environment that already is a hotbed of activity, where things are being made, where plans are being made, and exhibitions are going on. I don't know if all of you have had the good fortune to visit Temple Bar Gallery and Studios in Temple Bar in Dublin, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about the studios kind of paint a picture of that stairs where you where you first chatted about this. Okay, <laughs> I love talking about the studios, um, and I think the stairs is a fundamental part of it because Neve Studios on this in in Temple Bar there's a street facing gallery and then you come in and <clears throat> there's three floors four floors is it three floors above a above a, a street a ground floor. And on each floor, there's a studio. So Neve Studio is on the second floor, and we, our office is on the third floor. So Neve um, is, uh, those stairs were just a stairway away. And that really was a kind of, I suppose, a, a beautiful thing about, you know, working with, uh, working together on this. But the studios in Temple Bar are simple, bright spaces with windows, a sink, floorboards, and... Uh, and, it, and they're all of a decent size and, de and decent space and they're actually um, uh, just room of your own and 30 studios and in each studio the artists are making and working and figuring things out and they're for periods of time so they aren't uh, li for life you know there's turnover studios so they're but they are a place of incredible um making and 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 within the rooms but then there's this kind of thing that happens when you have a group of artists together and the kind of interaction that can happen the nurturing the conversations between themselves within ourselves and the whole thing is can be really very vibrant and actually sorry to go on but when we stopped during the the when we were all booted out of the studios by you know the water was turned off even from during the after 2020 with the pandemic, it was uh, it was kind of so 
house. It was so, so strange and uh, the emptiness. But as soon as was possible, the arts were back in that space. As, uh, yeah, so, Michael. Um, well, I suppose part of the proposal as well and the way it was formed over the months really related to the studio environment as well. And it's not only a place of making and production, it's a place of conversation and thinking and planning and testing, experimentation, revision, and further thinking and repetition of all those things. So, yeah, we just had that very special time, the three of us together, kind of every day. And that's continued through <laughs> every day <Years. laughs> in the past two or three years now. So we've had this kind of magic time together. Amazing. So you've painted us a picture of uh, Temple Bar and the studios and how it was and that you were in a bubble at, at moments. The actual pitching process, can you tell me the mechanics of how that works? Who are you pitching to? How do you do it? I can't imagine you had in-person interviews because presumably people couldn't be in the same room. So what was that, that, that actual pitching process like? And what did you pitch? Shall <laughs> I go? Yeah. <laughs> well, I was, there is often a thing that you have to have an idea, you know, what, what, are you, what exactly are you going to do, what's it going to look like, which I was trying to talk about earlier in that, that that's kind of an absurd way of working for a lot of artists, but I think it's it's such a particular gig that there's a maybe a fear of risk taking in relation to who would be chosen as well. Like if you don't know what they're going to do, then can you really stand behind this? And you know, there's a lot of um, I mean, there's a lot of money put into it, and then there's a lot of fundraising to be done by the people involved. So it's it's quite a it's quite a, a sort of a strange sort of quite singular gig in a way and but I, I don't know I just thought I don't really work like that so I'm just going to tell them how I work so the, pro the, the pitch was based on an approach to the space in Venice and an approach to making work and we just kind of thought let's just be really honest about this and we did that and we, we were interviewed we were in my studio for the interview and the panel was made up of Culture Ireland and the Arts Council and then an international panel of curators and uh, we, we kind of choreographed the entire pitch. We had seats, so one person would go into the seat in front of the computer, and then the other one would sit behind. Two metres distance. Yeah, we had to keep two metres distance. <laughs> <laughs> but we were all in the same space, and we kept putting masks on and off. It was completely absurd, like, you know, some, like, like kind of farcical in this kind of, you know, one COVID of the... choreography. Choreography, like COVID choreography, you know, online <laughs> pitching. It was, it was kind of funny you know, um, but we, we did it. And then they didn't tell us for like a week. Wow. Yeah, it's really, yeah. But, so. can, but can I say to that, because it, I think that was one of the things that because we were going on Zoom and Zoom was sort of new-ish, wasn't it? Like it wasn't that, yeah. Um, I suppose we just had that. I, I felt like because we were actually in the room together, that was another uh, lucky lucky stroke, you know, um, we weren't in three separate rooms all, all on Zoom. As a team, we were together. That was a lucky thing. Yeah. And as a team, you've remained together. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the team. That's how the pitch worked. I understand that internationally in different countries, there's a different approach to pitching. There's different mechanisms, different uh, hoops that you have to jump through. Just to give a bit of context to Venice, so uh, the biennial, as we said, happens every two years. Um, it's spread over a kind of maze of buildings. There are about 30 countries that have their own nation pavilions that are scattered around the Giardini. And then there's an area of Venice called uh, the Arsenale. And Ireland at Venice usually occupies one of the exhibition venues inside that Arsenale. Other countries also um, use palazzos and other kind of spaces around the incredible sinking wonderland that is Venice. And here behind us, we have an image. Maybe, Michael, you could tell us exactly what we're seeing. So this is probably pretty much this day last year, give or take. And it is a boat entering the Arsenale area and about to turn left into the dock where all of the artworks for the entire exhibition are unloaded. And the boat in the picture is carrying the scissor lift, which allowed Neve and our team, uh, Flan and Andreas, a technical team, 
to kind of work at five or six meter height in the, in the exhibition area. So this is kind of 10 a.m. on day one of the install, something like that. Wow. <laughs> and of course, Venice is a city of canals. And when you think about tall, sculptural, delicate, incredibly precious artworks and how to maneuver them along a complicated system of canals, it gives me a pain in my head. <laughs> I don't know how you did that, <laughs> but you did it. Um, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about how you three functioned as a team. And uh, you mentioned already Andreas and Flam, the uh, technicians, but give us a sense of, say, um, your first encounter with the room that was going to be the exhibition venue in the Arsenale. What was that like? What did it look like? What did it feel like? And this question is for all of you. Um, well, we, normally you would get it and you would go straight to Venice to check it out because it, it really matters to me to know the space I'm about to show in, actually. That's kind of the first thing I do. Normally, if I'm, if I'm offered an exhibition, is I go to the venue and I kind of spend time in the room and, and get the dimensions and kind of consider that, even if it's existing work, like where things would be placed or what will happen. And we, we couldn't, so we, we weren't allowed to travel. And in fact, so if we got it kind of early October, we didn't actually get to make a trip to Venice until September, the following September. So this was September 20, 21. 21. Yeah. Was the first time you saw the room that you were going to have this exhibition in? Yeah. Because at that point, we were all vaccinated and we could get the could passes. And, uh, and when we went, the architectural Biennale was on, which was, which was great. But the Irish space for the architectural Biennale had this very large um, kind of multimedia sculpture and had blacked out all the windows. And it, it, was, this, it was a really amazing piece, um, but it was based on kind of really intense noise and flashing lights and kind of uh, things like that. So it was quite difficult. <laughs> So you couldn't in actually the <laughs> see the structure, the architecture of the room. We kind of went in early before they turned it on and tried, <laughs> you know. But it was it was kind of funny because it was so hard to to engage with the with the room. Um, so we just had to, yeah, we had to kind of do our best. Um, and and I think and then we we sort of we tried to we made small uh, changes to the space, which are really complicated. Everything has to go through health and safety and kind of uh, Venetian architects and kind of everybody signing off on like just uh, all we were doing was like strengthening a wall to hang something or we were we built um, we blocked an electricity cupboard with a new wall and we put lighting in the room we saw know. in in the documentation of uh, Russ's film we got to see the architecture of the room as well as the exhibition as it was installed it's quite um it has a lot of character. It has presence, that architecture. How did you face that? You mentioned you changed some elements. Was there anything you changed f for the specific purpose of the exhibition? Yeah, strengthening the walls. So the walls couldn't hold any weight. So we couldn't hang anything on them unless we kind of took them apart and, and made them stronger. So there was, it was really practical things like that. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's an absurd place to show work because it's, it's, it's not meant for that. It's crumbling. And it's <laughs> and we're not allowed to touch anything. And the, the, there's a particular beautiful crumbling wall. And I think people have no sense of how much it is crumbling. So wow. we would go in and, and a whole section of the plaster of, would have fallen off the wall. And uh, there's masses of dust everywhere. People did warn us about, about lizards falling off the <gasps> rafters onto the work. And I, I think I got a bit nervous that that would happen onto the glass canopy that, you know. And there, was, there were pigeons in there. I think we had several calls from wow. mediators about pigeons in the space <laughs> with the glass. And, you know, so, and there's a lot of dust, a lot of dust. And so it's like a shed. This, it's, an, it's basically like yeah. a shed with a roof. No temperature control, no anything. Um, so, yeah. And, and, it's, and it's what they call a protected space. It means that, like, uh, you cannot touch the original fabric in the room, which is the bricks and the rafters and uh, you can't nail into anything and so yeah ideal <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of the flow of light and because light plays such a huge role in your work did you change anything about how light entered the space or did you embrace uh, the windows and the flow and take it as your kind of starting point your base material 
I actually think Neve has done the same thing during the tour and in tour venues as well. So if you get a chance to go to the model in Sligo or to us in Temple Bar, you'll see that kind of Neve has really treated all of the spaces in their most kind of pure forms and drawing attention to the windows and the doorways and the walls and opening up new windows where possible or, or old windows that were covered up. So rather than actually doing that much to the space, it was reverting it to its original state as much as possible. Uh, we're back to revealing and pairing back <laughs> and breaking the illusions. Yeah, it's an amazing space because you, you've come through a lot of um, interior corridors in the Arsenale. So by the time you get to Ireland, um, what has been now the Irish Pavilion for the past four or five kind of iterations of the Biennale, um, it's the first point where you actually see the water and it's kind of a main sort of exit point, which is kind of terrifying in a way because you think everyone's just going to get to here and they're exhausted and they're mm -hmm. just going to leave. You know, they're just going to escape to get air. But we just thought, well, we either, we either go with that and kind of just let people feel that about that space and, and enjoy that kind of, you know, where the way it holds that corner in the kind of journey through the entire Arsenale. So that was, that was very much part of both the pitch and, and, and my gut about the space. So maybe people did run out. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and, and it actually, it actually was, um, in a lot of ways, it was a, it was kind of really. A, I mean, just what you say there, Michael. Neve takes on a space and reveals things about it and makes spaces wherever she's in behave marvelously. Really great. Sorry, I, I promised myself I wouldn't use that word again. <laughs> but anyway, but but the but I but the. Um, now I've lost my thread at all. Well, uh, anyway, with a uh, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the things that the exhibition did, or I, at least I have a sense of it, having not physically been there, was give this moment of breath, this kind of holding space that could allow people enter into it after a very um, full and busy uh, journey through the through the kind of rooms that led up to it. Yeah. We didn't know what those rooms were going to be mm. in advance. So you're supposed to communicate with each other, and we tried to communicate, but we didn't hear until quite late in the day that, oh, mm. man, we're going to black out their space, for example. Um, and so they did. So it ended up like... In fact, I think all the previous rooms almost had blacked out. I think the previous five exhibitions yeah. didn't have any natural light. Yeah. So and we was, didn't know that yeah. in advance. Yeah, But that kind of was sort of like... You know, quite interesting because then when you did come into the Irish Pavilion, and I think we saw, we really got a sense of it through Russell's film yeah. there. You first came in and you came into a series of quite dark and more maybe busy spaces into a kind of dark and black tunnel and out into the crow. And the other entrance in was the, in if you would have come in, you would have seen vent the the big other led piece so it was was that but just i think that thing at the end and everyone has gone through so much and seeing so much already and you're in this uh moment when you actually can get out of the place and you think oh is this a good or a bad but actually it's funny because the room and the way it was handled but also maybe because there was that sense that you could leave as well but that sense that it held you and there was yeah. that kind of moment of uh like a sanctuary or something. So it became this room between. You would stop and you would stop uh, Beautiful. there. In some ways it sounds like um, it, was, it was actually perfect for, for what it did. Um, I think the documentation that we've seen, it's kind of a trick because we never would experience an exhibition like that, like this, this ghost space devoid of other people. And so much of your work, Neve, I feel is very relational and people bring to it uh, their own ideas, their own thoughts, their own readings, their own sense of meaning. And it really is when people are in the room with it that it comes alive in a way. But I wonder, of course, it's necessary to document work so that it can travel and so that we can hear about it and see things about it and understand it more. But were there ever moments in the exhibition when it was full with people or people were passing through or stopping and looking or pondering that you felt like this is it? This is the exhibition. This is exactly what we wanted to make. Yeah, 
It's, it's um, I mean, I think you should ask Michael about the install as well, because he stayed around for a month after we put it up and had scissors lifts and things driving through that space. So it was also, that, that space was also a thoroughfare. It was the main entrance for all the other spaces. So, which, it, which was, yeah, so scissors lifts and kind of, you know, pallet trucks and kind of bicycles. <laughs> in a place with no wheels, they were all in our room. And um, it was kind of really intense. But in terms of the venue, when it, when it did open, there was this amazing kind of um, happenstance, really, where an artist I'd met years before, a Croatian artist, um, Tomo Savage Gekin, had this, he was the Croatian artist this year, and it, by chance. And he contacted me and said, so I'm making this kind of performative piece where we're going to have a group of five um, dancers, move, people with choreographed movement who will move around different pavilions according to an algorithm, which is something to do with news um, headlines on the day. And there was a sign on Via Garibaldi, which is a main street in Venice, and every day it would tell you the, the different times and where the performances would happen. So they happened in almost every national pavilion. And we were one of them. And on the first few days, um, they came in, and, and what they did was, I suppose, kind of stood in relation to whatever the objects were in the room they were inhabiting. And they moved in this very particular, slightly kind of unified way, um, but the movements were quite uh, familiar and not particularly dancey or anything. So it might be just everybody would lean to the left or you know, maybe put their hand to the right. Um, and what was happening when they came in, it was amazing because everybody else seemed to just respond to them and their bodies in relation to the space as well. And I remember standing there going, it's like this person has just, has just kind of, is almost showing people, you know, how they can move in, in this room. And as they did, everybody else moved differently. And it was just incredible. Yeah, that just, just was a chance thing, but it felt like it really activated it for me. It sounds like the kind of thing that the strangeness, but also the sort of hotbed environment of Venice can lead to and can produce. So that was one of the other nations that was represented. I know there were 80 nations represented at the 59th iteration of the Venice Biennial. Did you have much chance to get to know other artists or the other um, curators and uh, representers of each different country, or was it very much everybody gets in, everybody gets out and breathes a sigh of relief? I suppose we had a very actually unique kind of experience because, as you can tell, language is such an important part of Neve's work and the project, making the exhibition book, which we'll talk about later today, was really important. So we actually went to Venice two months before the opening to install the exhibition so that we could photograph and document it for the book. So we were really one of the only countries there at the time and probably the first country to finish installing. So, but, but to answer your question, the, we were really lucky this year because there were lots of other artists and curators and teams who we had worked with before or were friends with. So there was this kind of nice communal situation that would happen in the weeks just leading up to the opening. It's interesting that you were able to install the show so far in advance of the actual opening. So then you could just sit back and relax. Sure, what else is there to do? <laughs> and that was, that was one of the, the, like, you know, just to the day, one of the sort of kind of tips that we had. And maybe it would, it would have happened anyway, but like when Mary Kremen did it with Eva Rothschild, she had gone out uh, early to do it and she said it's a good idea because especially as well if you want to get uh, documentation and photographs for the book. So it was, it, was, uh, it was always in our plan to get out early and do this. So yeah, I think we went out as soon as we actually were able to, to as soon as the arts finale was going to be available to work in. Yeah. And logistically, just going back to that install for a moment, with the distance, with the language, with the water, were there challenges you had to meet on a daily basis and how did you deal with it? The scissors lift in the boat? Yeah. It was too short. <laughs> it had to go back. <laughs> well, also, it's, I have to say, genuinely, it's much, much harder to get a UPS delivery in Temple Bar than it is to get anything <laughs> in, in Venice. <laughs> So, um, you know, realistically, it's, it's a city and it's a global city and fully functioning and it's mythologized in a way that it's 
kind of crumbling and old, but actually, you know, people live there and work there and have a job to do, and so everything is there that you can need. And you lived there. <laughs> well, I was very lucky. I got to stay for two months and kind of caretake the space um, in the meantime. Um, so yeah, uh, I suppose coming back to what you were just saying about people seeing people in the space with the work, we all only really saw that um, at the opening days because, because of everyone else working, the works were covered in dust sheets and plastic sheets and with cordons around everything to protect it. So just those few days before the opening, everything was revealed then and actually seeing people's bodies and forms in relation to the sculpture was really amazing for us. Um, but logistically, there were things like we decided, I don't know, there, was, there were delays and we decided we'd paint the walls ourselves because the painters weren't going to work on the weekend. And we were trying to get, you know, we had quite a tight timetable, actually, to get the photographs done, to get back, to get the book to print and, you know, all of that. So we, you know, the paint had to be got in a hardware shop, of which there are. But then you have to bring everything on a trolley across Venice and up and down all of the steps. I and remember like, Kleena telling me. There was a lot of me. trolleys. There was a lot of trolleys and a lot of carrying books and a lot of carrying pamphlets and leaflets and sort of... Coffee. Coffee. <laughs> you the couldn't walk get to coffee. get the coffee was a 30-minute round trip. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and uh, I, I, I do think, though, that <clears throat> there were concentrated periods of time and you were... It was great. Michael was there for so long and that was really incredible as well. Um, but I think you were when you were there, you were really there, and the distance wasn't there. Yeah. And then you, the water is lovely because it's lapping and kind of very nice. And then there's the April spritz, and the whole thing <laughs> helps the language. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> I wanted to ask you a question about how the team functioned, but I think we're getting a good sense from chatting with the three of you that you make a very good team. Could you talk a little about whether you had individuated roles? I mean, obviously, there's the artistic, there's the curatorial, there's the technical, there's the logistical, there's all the different layers. But how did you meet that, in a way? Uh, I would say that, like, we didn't, like, we, and, uh, you know, we all performed, obviously, Neve made the work, Michael did a lot of the, and curatorial on, on and also being present there as well and all of that around and, and each of them can speak to that to the but I um to even organizing transport and all of that um but I think uh I suppose in a way I don't I don't know my feeling of it was that we had we didn't have like a big we had a plan we definitely had plans and we had this thing called a budget right <laughs> and in the budget you had all these lists of th items you know see so it of the artist fee and the production and the material and, that. and in a way that kind of was a sort of a plan that you didn't actually pull out much and it happened there were phases as well there were definitely phases it felt like it, it the whole thing and there was a semi seamlessness and there were a lot of moving parts and lots of different people who were involved like alex is here and the the, the designer and there were the people Neve worked with and there was a you know so there were many many components to it and there were ultimately zillions of conversations in and out of the office uh, how many she, emails? Uh, maybe there, maybe maybe there was buckets of emails. Do you count your emails, Michael? <laughs> I saw it recently, and it was getting up to seven thousand received. So, I think I think that people don't realise you're almost building an institution because you have to. It's like you're building from scratch. Yeah, it's like you're because everything from you know, some sort of, we wanted to have some sort of identity. So every time the screen comes up and says gather, I mean, Alex worked on that from the beginning and we built a website at the beginning and we, we said we'll try and be consistent with all of this. And we had to have the writers who are going to speak later involved from early on, even though I couldn't tell them what I was doing yet. And, um, you know, but the thing about us all working together, that thing of being in the same building was incredibly useful because you know yourself, you can send three emails or you can have like a, five minute conversation, which moves us along so much quicker. So there was a lot of running up and down between the studio and the office, and that really, really was far more efficient for us. 
And we kind of all knew everything. And we still do about the whole project. Like it wasn't, it wasn't very sharply delineated roles where, you know, Clean is doing this, Michael's doing this. We, we kind of all knew everything that was going on. Um, but there was a lot of behind the scenes fundraising to kind of make it happen, which was quite complicated and a bit scary at the beginning. Like, can we, can we pull this off? And I know Kleena was really heavily involved in that. And then Michael was very much leading a kind of the overview of like the, the sort of visual kind of um, identity of it with Alex and stuff like that, as well as a lot of the logistics. So yeah, but we all knew, we all knew the whole thing. You all say. knew everything all the time. All the time. The other That's thing, the other thing as well was that, like again, just I suppose just to reiterate, that Neve Studio was just on the floor below, so you could go in and out all the time, and really, so it wasn't like oh, let's plan the studio visit for this time and these hours. It was just kind of, you know, all the time, mm -hmm. and it it wove into the daily life of. Temple Bar Gallery and Studios as well. So sometimes Venice was gone, and then other times it was, well, never was like, but but it was, you know, you had to do other things. And I do want to say, because Anne, Anne Matthews is here as well, and she was, she's the chair of Temple Bar Gallery and Studios, and she really did get us going with the fundraising. <laughs> and we did get, uh, you know, so there were things like that that were really supportive underneath it all, you know, so that was, and that was the shape of, I suppose, the Venice that we could do. Yeah. It sounds like there were countless kind of leaps of faith that had to be taken. For a start, you mentioned when you spoke to the writers to invite, uh, or the filmmakers to invite them to respond, you couldn't tell them what the work was. And that's because you didn't know yet, because you couldn't know until you went to Venice and had a sense of the exhibition space. But this kind of leap of faith that you had to take, I think everybody everybody was taking that kind of countlessly. Did it feel like that? And when you speak about the kind of phased, uh, phasedness of the project, there was a budget and that gave some structure. There was a space and that gave some structure. There were ideas that you wanted to impart and that brings a certain amount of structure as well. But I think it also feels, I guess now on reflection, that it must have been such a gallop at times, such a, such a pace. Yeah, I mean, leap of faith is a really good way of putting it because you're just trying to, you're always doing things at the wrong time. So you're trying to say what you need, you know, what you need to build in the space or what kind of lighting you need even before you've made the work or you, you have to kind of, um, yeah, contact the writers before you can describe things fully or everything felt like that. Everything felt too soon, you know. I mean, Alex was sending, you know, um, sort of uh, typefaces. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> you know what's going to work with it and we were having to make decisions around that you know it just felt it felt slightly absurd and and I guess in, in a normal project there is a kind of an institution or a building or and a kind of you know all of those kinds of things are at least set and there's people with jobs in place but I think what people don't realize about something like this is that it involves so many people mm. you know from designers to photographers to you know, people who helped us with, with marketing to, you know, kind of, um, to, to writers, to all the fabricators I worked with, which is a huge, huge part of it. And Jenny's film that you'll see later gives some sort of insight into that. But, you know, it, I think at one point, I think I figured it was about 40 people who were key kind of members of this. So it's yeah. not some single thing that one person is doing. And then a big part of it was that 15 mediators who we kind of um, brought, who came to Venice for four to five weeks at a time and looked after the exhibition, actually spent longer in it than any of us, <laughs> kind of probably got to know it better than any of us. Um, and they were a huge part of the team, you know, going forward as well. So I believe that some of those mediators are here among yeah. us today. Is that right? That is right. <laughs> I wonder, could we ask one of the mediators to tell us a little bit about the experience, what it felt like? Would that be an OK question to ask? If you'd like to share with us how long you were there for and basically, what did you have to do? OK, um, I'll go through it first. Um, I was there in October uh, for the four weeks and, I mean, a big part of it was the cleaning of the dust. So <laughs> maintaining the exhibition, yeah. which is something that you'd rarely think about. How do you maintain the artworks? Yeah, so we had little paintbrushes. We were going around to get the dust off and um, making sure everything was polished and nice. But, I mean, just seeing how people reacted 
coming into the space and like that uh, they're coming out of a dark few rooms so they do come in and sometimes people did go for the door first but then they came back to have a look and other times people saw the ledge near the window so they went right down to sit which was lovely as well because they do spend more time then um, and it was like a relaxed enough space for people to want to spend time in um, so it was lovely like that and um, then just getting to talk to people about the work, what they thought. Some people wanted really quick snippets of how you'd summarise it and other people really got into a conversation with you. Um, so for me anyway, it was about like really getting back to the materiality of something and seeing the skills that are pulled out of like very familiar materials that are usually quite rigid and dull other times, <laughs> do you know? Yeah. But like finding like something really special in them. And if you spend enough time looking at it, you will be able to find that really special thing. So it actually encourages you to like look at something in a way more detailed way, in a way more special way than how you might do usually in your day to day. Wow. So yeah, it was an amazing time. Yeah, Beautiful. I'll do it to Nadia now. <laughs> Hi everybody. <laughs> um, I have to say a huge part of being a mediator because Neve's work is really tactile and um, kind of serves, like, you know, blurs the line between function and dysfunctional. Um, there was a lot of times people would come in and like almost try to put their hat on holds or try to sit on something. So a huge part was like being vocal and explaining to people really nicely about the work that it is really tactile and it is really inviting, but actually you can't do that. But it was a great starting point for conversation as well about the work. Um, and it's funny seeing the pictures of Venice today, like I almost feel the sand and the grit under my feet and kind of like smell the canal as I see Neve's work up here. So it kind of brings me right back. So it was strange being in the model today and smelling the sea in the West. And I was like, oh, this is so strange. It's not Venice, it's the West, but it's that familiar thing of bringing in like the other elements as well that kind of tie in with the work, even going beyond architectural. But um, there was a, there's one point um, I'd love to kind of bring up is that the other pavilions were actually quite bold and maybe dealt with, you know, some strong political or climate crisis that they wanted to champion. But actually being in Neve's exhibition, I found myself going to work early and being like, OK, that noise isn't on right now in the next pavilion and I can just sit here in Neve's work and actually remind myself of what it's like to be Irish and like watching birds out the window with my mum and seeing the bird dip in its head in, in this work. And yeah, it was a really nice, subtle, meditative space that you could kind of sit in and just relax and not kind of think of the other kind of violent artworks maybe. Wow. So that was a really special experience for me. Wow, beautiful. It sounds like you both had a pretty good time and also kept the dust at bay and kept the work intact and stopped the people touching <laughs> when necessary <laughs> the incredibly tactile work. That's beautiful and, and maybe leads me on to ask a little bit about what your kind of hopes and aspirations with the project were. Is that what you wanted to, to enact, that feeling, that sense of calmness that you describe so beautifully and the sense of a breath and the sense of almost, but not quite, touching. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I ever think this is what I want the work to do. You know, it's, the work evolved and, and became something and I wanted it to hold the space. I think that was as much as I'd hope for, you know, that it would kind of keep people there. And I mean, there's a very, there's a very kind of deliberate um, insertions of things like the moving image which shifts the your sense of time in a room so if you've got something flickering in the corner of your eye it sort of changes your how long you will maybe stay with something because I mean how long does one take to look at a sculpture I mean people tend to just scan it and feel like they've encountered it but there's something about having inserted some of those moving images in the space which felt important in terms of shifting the sort of timeline of how long you would stay there. So that was kind of um, clear and deliberate. In terms of what we hope for it in a more general way though, I think, um, I think that it's a really important thing that Ireland are there. And I mean, it's not like when, when you go to Venice, people don't say, oh, did you see Neva Mali's work in that space. They see, did you see Ireland? Did you see France? Did you see Estonia? Did you see Oman? Or whatever it is. And I mean, there's this thing of like, it is really important that Ireland is there. And it felt, we felt so pleased that we were it this time, you know, but it's really important it continues because ultimately 
it's a really small country, and there's a you know the visibility and the audience numbers that the work gets abroad. Eight hundred thousand people yeah, passed through. It was the biggest Venice. ever. Yeah, it was the biggest ever attendance for Venice, and obviously to do with COVID and people just really feeling like they wanted to go and see art and see it in person, which is amazing. But I think that that you know I really hope it's something that, and I do, I think it is something that Culture Ireland and the Arts Council are fully committed to. But I think it's incredibly important that Ireland is there. And um, and the next person will be announced in the next weeks, actually. So good luck Exciting. to them. <laughs> it's epic. But um, do you think they'll be from Mayo again? <laughs> who knows? There's a lot of really great people from Mayo. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, we were just we just felt really just kind of like it was amazing that we got to do this and and be those people this time, you know. Yeah, you've accomplished something incredible. <laughs> and the wonderful thing is that it gets to have a life after just Venice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so Ireland at Venice is all about kind of elongating the possibility of that and the tour, mm. um, the Irish tour, mm. yeah, which, I hope is, people which get is what we're on now. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. Yeah. Um, I hope people get to see the model because it is pretty much every work from Venice and then a lot of other work because it's a far bigger venue. So there's, there's over six rooms and there's, there's work um, from a few years before Venice alongside the Venice work. And then in, in Dublin, which just opened last week, there's a lot of new work alongside some of the works from Venice. The yeah. works that have traveled from Venice, do you think, this is maybe a, a strange question, but do you think they mean something different in Venice than, than what they mean in Sligo in the model or what they mean in Dublin in Temple Bar? I mean, I think everybody is carrying stuff with them. It's interesting to hear Nadia talk about the smell of the sea in, in, in um, Sligo and then the smell of the canal in Venice. I mean, I, you know, every time you walk into a room to see a piece of work, you're bringing your day with you or you're bringing your mood with you. So in that sense, everything's shifting all the time. So for me, it was, and that's a, it's not a cop-out, it's just a, a truth. And it, to reposition the works physically in the different architecture of the model was really exciting because yeah. they look so much bigger, actually, in, in the model because the scale, you know, the architecture is smaller. So, yeah. so that double canopy with the two black kind of um, structures um, is enormous. It's reaching into the rafters, literally. And I was able to separate things out. So there, you know, the, the um, piece covers the low piece with the kind of domed... Uh, stone set into a wooden base you know that's in this really small domestic space with a kind of hearth and a really low window and and that entire environment felt actually built for it even though it technically wasn't but so to be able as an artist to reposition things in a new architecture is kind of exciting and kind of you know reactivates the work for me as well and is is been it's been a really nice part of it yeah amazing I mean, the, the Irish tour is, is, is really interesting, and it's also interesting, obviously, the two different, your questions, really, you know, <clears throat> you know the two, the, how it's received and how it is. But I suppose just the, um, the, the fact that the tour has taken this form as well is quite interesting because, it, I mean, I have to say, it's almost like it's a, it's a whole new job of work in itself, and like it is incredible that Neve has made a, an entire body of work for Temple Bar. And that's, I think, incredible. And I think it's really exciting. And I think it's what artists want is it is also the to the the, <clears throat> the thing that will happen as as well after this, you know, so but the but the um, but the shape of the tour and the fact that it was that we were able to do it in this way as opposed to the same exhibition coming back, but also the way that Neve would think about space and that. So that so actually the works hold something strongly of what they were in Venice, but they just have another aspect when you go into a different room. They just feel something like they are of themselves, but I'm looking at the limestone drain, drains in Temple Bar and uh, certain attentions you give to it there yeah. that are different to the ones in Venice, but then that's, that's my taking it. Amazing. I feel like now might be a good time to open to the floor for any questions that anybody might have. I wonder, is anyone brave enough to ask something? We have a question. 
Congratulations to the three of you. It's so nice to hear you speak about the work. Um, Neve, this is a question for you about the exhibition in Temple Bar. Um, and it was so nice to go and see the Venice work alongside your new work. But I wondered how it felt for you in that moment to show new work when there's so much attention on you um, after the Biennale. And um, I mean, I was really struck by the fact that you did that and I thought it was wonderful. But I wondered did it, how you felt about it. Did it make you feel nervous? Were you excited to show something else after this period? I don't know. We've got a few writers here. I'm sure the second book is always uh, like mine. And I have actually done quite a lot of exhibitions before this, but yeah, it's 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 like it felt like a different kind of pressure. And and actually doing anything at home as well, like with you know in front of the people you know best and whose opinions you value most, is also particularly kind of scary. But um, there was also the reality that Venice opened in April 21st, I think, last year, and um, everybody seemed to think that I was really busy last year. But actually, the show was up. <laughs> and I was mostly kind of in the studio going, what am I going to do now? You know, what, what do I do next? So it was a huge relief from early on. We thought, we're going to do this. You know, we're going to, like, have the tour, have the, the kind of next point involved in it as well, because otherwise it's, it's kind of strange. You know, you have to move your work on. And, and also, that's what I felt like doing, frankly. I didn't feel like just sitting there. So... It was, um, it was brilliant to be able to bring that into this idea of a tour, you know, for me on a practical level that I was able to kind of move on and make new work and make, take the next step so I wasn't kind of left sort of shunted and <laughs> closed after this, um, after this bigger project. It was almost like you'd planned it. Almost like you'd planned <laughs> it. Mm. And it was, in, in one way, it was part of the whole proposal yeah. at the start. Wow. Yeah. So it was on our budget sheet. <laughs> <laughs> From the very beginning. It was an item. Yeah. The approach was drafted and that's what you followed through with. I feel like I can hear a bird. <laughs> can anybody else hear that? Yeah. It's the radiator. It's the radiator. I'm thinking about what it might have been like in the space of the exhibition uh, if a lizard had dropped on canopy <laughs> or if a bird had flown in through one of the massive doors. Oh, they did. They did. Oh, they did. <laughs> <laughs> Two birds. Wow. Cleena actually called um, like Birdwatch Ireland or something like this to get advice on how to remove pigeons. Uh, what do you call it? Like, With the greatest care from, possible. From the, from the space, yeah. I think that's a really lovely kind of um, way to, to know Kleena. <laughs> and Kleena, I, kn I know you as a curator and a director and all kinds of wonderful things, but you are the person who would call Birdwatch Ireland to make sure that you're doing it in the, in the correct way, in the way that's most humane for the bird. So that's a be it beautifully reflects your entire approach <laughs> to your work, I think. It's lovely. Oh, we have a question. The costs involved of such a project by so many people <laughs> to and fro into Venice, for example. Um, it's the, that's as long as a piece of string, but the thing is that it costs money because you've got to, you know, first of all, there's a budget from Culture Ireland and there's one from the Arts Council, but there's a shortfall. And um, yeah, like for example, there are fixed costs, what the pavilion costs, ex you know, and they're, they're actually a big chunk of the money. So um, I don't know how to put a figure on that because every, you know, but it, you're talking a sizable sum of money and that's not going into either the artist's pocket or into the, only the production of work. So you can imagine there's so many elements to it, but we are, committed to and really pushing the fee for the artists and the production money for the art because that is really um that's really really where you you know where where where, where you really want to ensure that that is uh, um, am, ambitious and allows the ambition but i don't know i can't really we can't really give a, an exact figure i mean we could but <laughs> i mean are we talking thousands or millions Oh, no, 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 hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of that, okay. And do the visitors um, that come in to see the pavilions, for example, are they paying visitors? Yeah, yeah. They pay the Biennale, not us. 
Okay. So there's, I think it was a 25 euro, I think, entry fee to the Biennale, but not for us. We don't gain anything from that. And the fee for the, you know, so the rental for the pavilion, so Culture Ireland, I mean, a lot of this is publicly um, available. So Culture Ireland will publish the budget that they, or the money that they give towards the Venice Biennale for the architecture or the visual arts. That's written on their website. Um, but the money that they put up, most of that goes to pay rental on the space mm -hmm. in Venice. That's what that money is mostly um, given to. And uh, I suppose like uh, another country that's not in one of the official venues, um, for example, might get 10% of the number of visitors to this offsite pavilion. Whereas the 800,000 who have seen the main exhibitions, you know, that's what Culture Ireland are really valuing because it's, it's people from all around the world seeing an Irish artist and Irish art in this huge international context. So, so that's what what's, that's what they're putting their value on. Yeah. Actually, I heard the numbers for an offsite pavilion, um, and I think their numbers were thirty five thousand. So, so if you had, and then having to do that, you would have to find a Venice a, a space to rent in Venice and kind of go through all of that, and probably cost the same amount of money. So stuff like that. Also, there's a lot of things that you decide as a team to do, so you didn't have to bring over the mediators from Ireland to look after the space. That was something that we felt was really important from the beginning. We wanted specifically to do that. We could have had Italian interns mm -hmm. from Venice for a lot less money, but we wouldn't have had that kind of thing of, of these amazing people who sat in the room and dusted the work mm -hmm. and, um, and spoke to everybody who came in and you know had the experience of living in Venice for four or five weeks as well and of seeing all that work. So we felt like that really important thing that we wanted to budget for. So that's the thing about you could do it differently, but um, you could make different kinds of work that maybe would cost less to make or to ship. So there is a kind of a lot of variables in the costs. And how did the visitors get there? Did they all have to come by boat? Um, you, could, you fly to uh, an airport which is on the water in Venice, and uh, then you can get a water taxi, which or a water bus, sorry. So from... From the airport <laughs> into the city. Um, so there's water buses, Vaporetto, and uh, water taxis if you're wealthy. <laughs> we don't think we it's, ever it's got... A, did I we ever get a taxi? No. no. I think it's like, it's like what you said there, Michael, as well. It is a, glo a global city, and it, it functions very well <laughs> in, in every way. Mm. But, uh, yeah. Nightmare for uh, anyone with mobility difficulties. Yeah. or beca yes. Because of all the steps and all the... Uh, bridges, it can be very tricky to traverse. Don't bring a buggy if you're going. <laughs> I wonder if you could say something about your use of materials, um, which look modest, but I know hold sort of very particular um, sourcing references and such. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um I suppose they, they each feel like the right material for the form I, was I wanted to make. So there's been points, like when I started to use steel, I wanted to make very uh, long lines in a room that went from ceiling to floor. And the only material that you could use that would do that was steel. So it, that was, say, how I started to use that as a material. Then when I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about kind of a very domestic type of shaping and holding and um, like hooks and handles and shelves, and it felt like wood was just the right thing. And, and the sense of materials that are very familiar to you, that you, even if you um, don't read the description and find out that that's beach, or you know, even from looking at it, you should know what it is, you know, that you should be able to recognize it as a material that's familiar, that you would know what it would feel like to touch it, the polish on it, or with the stone that you would know that it would feel cold, you know, to touch, and, and so there was no kind of there's there's a deliberate use of materials that are that are very kind of clearly what they are, and there's I mean I actually did powder coat for the first time in my life, um, because I I don't love that, but the space was so there was so much um, potential for rust <laughs> in the room, and um, it needed that kind of kind of graphic form to hold its own against the the brick wall, but but that would be rare for me to kind of like in a way coat or cover the material. So there, was, so there were very specific decisions made um, in Venice to do with that. Um, and I could talk for about an hour about glass, so I don't know <laughs> if I um, should. Maybe I'll leave that to later. <laughs> Super. 
Um, are there any other questions before we break for the interval? Do I see any? Hi. It's not really a question, it's just an observation that I think it seems incredibly unfair that you have to fundraise as well as <laughs> all the work that you do. And even though it's open, as you say, to anybody to submit, you know, for Venice, that really cuts out people who don't have a great organization like this behind them. I consider that very unfair. I think you're so right. Yeah. <laughs> so, just thank you. Say, oh. Sorry, just to say on that, apparently there will be more funds put in, and we've oh. really fought for that. So hopefully it's going to be easier for the next people. But I we completely agree, because people don't also know what they're getting themselves into, you know, or how much it might cost. Yeah. Thank you, Neve. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Kleena. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're now going to have a very short 15 minutes break, and we need you back promptly um, at five past for a very a prompt start at 10 past, if that's okay, 10 past four. Thank you.
Clark or Up, Down, Charm, Strange, Top and Bottom. There now, grapple, and as things stood, it was never much harder to get to the tip, prong, spike, or its point, or its crux, or those bits on the side, or the light around the back, or the tiniest suggestion that where it was located might, or indeed might not, be real, real, or reeling in, as if reeling was anything to do with anything, especially not ground, and definitely not air, particularly when they occupy so much of themselves and without inclination to spin. Wait, rotate, what? Wait, on picking itself from all area adjacents and endeavouring in action wherever gravity grips. So sedate and resistant to unintentional slips of the spreading of space somewhat thin. But worth noting how, even casually lent, it lovingly hugs the flexions of its own tendons, the corruption of its sinews and the wayward of its joints, impermeable to air and immutable by earth, it minds not one solitary thing. Alas, digression though, from the point and the crux, air and ground, if they're still doing that, being the upside or downside of the majority of stuff, components, integrants, leaps of thought, backward inclinations when masses maraud or the clock talks one then two, any number in fact, white face flat and thin hands black. Although last I looked, I saw time looking back, savouring its imposition and inescapable matter, which really is no matter at all. But here is not for that. Here's for air and ground and what stretches across all that can in some way be conceived. Tricks of it too. It does them itself, relishing misadventure when it's least expected. Diversionary tactics are also sometimes in order, depending on the time and place. And... Again, once upon a time, I found it making findings from around my spine, hewing its bones and connectors from the opposite of mine and from all hallowed hollows, chiseling shapes, taking its inside from my outside, perhaps, or the other way, the first way round. Either way, I spread myself like glass, the better not to be inverted or everted for a laugh or for the sake of what I have not yet been informed. Not that I'm off the mind to wholly object, not often or often much, unstinting as I am about the ca being the cast from which all else gets made. Or is it I doing the moving, cutting myself off from the land and sky, those dull lights negative of time, space and time, and from the words unspoken, images unseen, from the yes, from that, what is that anyway, substance rubbed between finger and thumb, Purpose, equivocal, meaning, none, or some, or made from a word like wood, which moves itself round an elliptical world, restless enough not to get pinned down or pinned up, nailed to the sticking place of content or context, hammered into interpretation and strung out for effect. Maybe, yes, but no, I am not that. Maybe I won't be encroached upon by extent, expansion, or exertion and its intents, with their foregone conclusions proudly displayed, with their every possibility already named, numbered, and placed in the drawer, a vacuum-packed, perfectly preserved example of knowability, invariant and fixed. Who wouldn't like the convenience of it? Slabs of the, uh, slabs of the unsuggestible and mouthfuls of fine, all durable and balanced as far as the eye can reach, forward into time's mess, and everything contemplable within touch of the skin, quantifiably curated into the very last inch of sanity at the first inkling of bore. I may not plump for this. I might instead step around to where connotations rot, with a fervent and somewhat intelligent panache once absented by the fiery and the sure. Row, row, row your row, gently up your row. Merrily, 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 it's as far as you will go. Despite or because or behind hand of all that, on the inmost I think, I am munificent, to a fault, free in my giving, as is my wont, of the gift of maybes and the better, maybe nots. For if not lovely tangible, I am imaginable at least, although perhaps only in my outmost form. But I'll tweak on interaction and outer too, quark and anti-quark just the same. And consequences are fine, except when I twist which can make some seals up the side get split, which can mean leaking over, which can make melds go to bits and symbiosis flop to the floor. Get out of that. 
Go find your own catastrophe. But mostly grand, whatever about the wailing and gnashing of teeth, when the ear fills the eye or the nose gets the mouth, they can, for the most part, be unpicked. And don't we know, anyway? Can't we always tell? Aren't we very, very sure? Except in weather, or mirrors, or standing alone, or when the light goes crossways, or when the light goes out, or when the sky looks funny and the air smells bad, or when we are asleep, awake, or become ver versions of that which will encompass all varieties in the end. Still, whatever, I am always just myself, sometimes in amalgamation, sometimes isolated, and as matter makes matter and space makes space, I am room and bare room just the same, whether you are looking or not. Whether or not the motor purrs or grinds to a halt, I am the whole machine, pondering the limits of the limits and the limits of those limits again, available both to glue and to unglue, for model and moulding, or separating out too, for being on my feet of clay with a head stuffed with cumulus. And I will say this much again, I never saw a black hole, either inside or out, but I often saw a river and stepped into it, just the once though, and never again, as the philosopher said, because it's never the same, nor labours beneath the designs to be. Never so heavy though, and never so free. Never spinning off deflections, never more or less than potentially, never being sometimes, or always being, interchangeably. So, in summation, I myself play my part, while also playing, not at all. Emer, thank you for this perfect re-immersion back into the second half of today's program. Many of you will know Emer as a celebrated writer, but did you also know that she spent many of her formative years right here in County Mayo? Emer McBride is the author of three novels, Strange Hotel, The Lesser Bohemians, and A, a Girl is a Half-Formed Thing. She's created performance work, published non-fiction, and is the recipient of more prizes that I can mention here today. The text you just heard was commissioned by Neve and Ireland at Venice as a response to Neve's work and ideas for Gather, alongside two other writers, Lizzie Lloyd and Brian Dillon. Brian Dillon uh, is a London-based author whose books include Affinities, Suppose a Sentence, Essayism, and In the Dark Room. His writing has appeared in Art Forum, Freeze, The New Yorker, New York Review of Books, and The Guardian, and he's curated exhibitions at Tate and Hayward Galleries. We're going to hear from Brian shortly with a reading, lucky us, but before we do, we're going to watch a film that was made by a wonderful filmmaker and artist called Jenny Brady, again at Neve's invitation. Jenny Brady, who we're delighted to have here with us today, is an artist filmmaker based in Dublin, exploring ideas around speech, translation and communication. Her films have been presented at much lauded film festivals internationally and screened in Dublin at the IFI, IMA, Project Art Centre, and further afield. Her works are distributed by Lux, and she's a studio artist at the now infamous Temple Bar Gallery and Studios. So we'll watch the film Gather by Jenny Brady now.
sometimes you can feel it, sometimes you can't, sometimes you can check to put the bulb up to the light, let the light shine across it, and you can see. Oh, yeah. 
hello. Um, I'm not quite sure how to follow something as beautiful as, as that, except to get my materials in order. And um, I think I'd like to read a couple of things to you that I very much hope relate um, in some ways to um, what you've just seen, um, as well as something of what's been said and discussed already today. I've been, I realized recently, talking to Neve about her work and thinking about the work for slightly longer than I've actually been looking at the work. Um, Neve and I first met in 2007, I think, and we began to have a discussion by email and by phone about the possibility that I would write something for uh, an exhibition, for, for a publication. And it took a little bit of time before I actually got to be in the presence of the work in the, in the way that you've just seen uh, in this beautiful film. And so I want to read you two things that I think kind of touch on the relationship between, for me as a writer, how I experience wanting to stay very close to somebody's work when you have this kind of relationship that is not approaching the work as a, as a critic, but as a slightly different kind of writer. And the sense that you really want to, to be close to the form, to the materials, to the presence of that work. And at the same time, to do justice to where else that work takes you. Um, and where the artist's own words and ideas and conversation have taken you. And those things seem to me to be to working together and also sometimes a little bit in tension with each other. So I think the first thing I'll, I'll read, um, earlier on, Neve interestingly used the word affinity. Um, and I'm gonna read the very opening pages um, from my um, new book, Affinities, which is a book about mostly about images, mostly about art. Um, and it's trying to say something about love, in a way, um, about images and artworks that I love, but also something about how these things connect um, to each other. And so this is just called Essay on Affinity One. I found myself frequently using the word affinity and wondered what I meant by it. An attraction, for sure, to certain works of art or literature, to fragments or details, moods or atmospheres inside of them. To a sentence, for instance, or an essay, but just as easily to an impression diffusing in the mind that could not be traced back to source. A fascination with this or that artist, writer, musician, filmmaker, designer, with a body or a body of work. Fascination already finding words with which affinity has affinities. Fascination as something like but unlike critical interest, which has its own excitements, but remains too often at the level of knowledge, analysis, conclusions. At worst, the total boredom of having opinions. But also the way things, images, and ideas sidled up to each other, seemed to seduce one another, in ways I could not or did not want to explain. So that when I wrote affinity in a piece of critical prose, maybe I was trying to point elsewhere, to a realm of the unthought, the unthinkable, something unkillable by attitudes or arguments. Not a question of beauty or quality or taste, other supposedly eternal aesthetic values, but something fleeting, Affinities don't all or always last. In the end, and for reasons above as well as others to come, something a little bit stupid. I'd been writing about images for about 20 years, finding affinities rather than deploying any kind of expertise because I'm no art historian. Still, it had felt like an education, a second training in the image after my first in the word. For a long time, I had been saying or writing affinity, but also dreaming, never exactly conceiving, a way of thinking about art, about objects and images that belonged to artists, including the contemporary artists whose studios I might visit and find myself staring at pictures 
that they had stuck to the wall, books and artifacts on their shelves. I had thought in passing about how these, or the smartphone photographs and the notes app reading lists that the artists sent me afterwards, how they sat alongside each other in more or less oblique relations. And then, when I came to write up my encounter with the work, wouldn't easily translate into the language of influence or subject matter or research. Wouldn't easily translate, that is, if the art was any good. Sometimes everything explained itself far too well. How do you describe, as a writer, the relation it seems the artist has with their chosen and not chosen, what's the word? Talismans, tastes, sympathies, familiars, superstitions, affinities. And the second thing I want to read really briefly um, is the beginning of the essay that I was uh, extraordinarily pleased to contribute to this very beautiful um, publication for Venice. Um, and maybe this says a, a little bit um, about these two directions, um, or two of the many directions, that as a writer trying to respond to work, and trying to respond sometimes to work that is not yet made or is in the process of being uh, made. On the one hand, trying to stick close to it. On the other hand, trying to follow it somewhere. And this piece is called Luster, partly because it's about glass, but it doesn't start there. In 1911, the German sociologist Georg Simmel published an essay titled The Handle, a reflection on the intimate gap between a work of art and the world of which it is part. Imagine a vase, whether classical, Chinese, modern, or mundane. It is, says Zimmel, a self-involved object, but not completely. Aesthetically remote inside its usually curvaceous form, the vase joins the universe via its handle, where it projects, this is Zimmel, projects into that real world which relates it to everything external to an environment that does not exist for the work of art as such. Zimmel doesn't say much about the real life hands, bodies, or persons by which this manual encounter between work and world comes about. He's not especially interested in the object's maker or its user, but remains at an aesthetic remove. It is, he says, as if the soul were an arm, reaching but not grasping the inviting curve of the handle. Among its contributions to aesthetic theory, Zimmel's essay is extraordinary for this overwhelming reason. The fact that he has chosen, that he has thought rather, so hard about mere handles in the first place. Things so close to hand are often invisible to philosophical consideration, if not to art. The handle comes to mind when thinking about the work of Nia Vomali. And not only because Handel is the title of one of her own works, as well as the title that she gave to an exhibition at the Royal Hibernian Academy in uh, 2019. Now, on the other side of a pandemic period in which maybe we have all paid too much attention to the things close to hand, to the limited space available to us, here is a body of work that appears to exist in the reflective void between familiar objects and their alien life in art. In wood, in glass, steel, and stone, O'Malley has fashioned an array of objects and some images that are of this world and out of it at the same time. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Brian, for leading us so beautifully into our final um, and second and final panel for today. And we're calling this panel Response to a Request because I have the pleasure of being joined by two of the people that Neve um, invited to respond to her work and her ideas as part of Ireland at Venice. So I'm going to start by asking you, Neve if you can tell us a little bit about your decision to invite writers 
in particular, Emer McBride and Brian Dillon, but all the creative responses you worked with. How did that decision come about to invite uh, writers or other creatives and artists to respond to your work in their own discipline or with their own material? Yeah, I have a people I'd like to work with at some point, and Venice is a good calling card. Um, when I, 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 it's worth saying maybe when I first asked Brian to write, in, he wrote it for me in 2008. I think I'd just come out of reading a lot of kind of art theory about, after doing PhD and, and reading a lot of texts around art, which came from people who wrote in a very particular way. And then I'd read his, his book, In the Dark Room, and um, in it, you know, the way he, as a writer, encountered um, imagery and pulled it into his life, and, and it, it, it just the relationship um, to description, to images, just felt so powerful and different from the things I'd been reading. And I was like, I wonder, can you ask somebody like that to write, as opposed to asking somebody who's kind of known as a, an art critic, you know, whose job it is as such to write? Because I wasn't really fully conscious of the fact that you've been writing, particularly about photography, at that point. Um, and I just, it, it sort of seemed surprising to me that people didn't ask writers as opposed to people whose discipline was separate. So that, that was partly. And then it had been long enough for me to ask him again, basically. <laughs> I'd left him alone for long enough. Um, but we had kept conversations over the years, and actually Brian had written bits um, about my work over the years, so that was really helpful. So I felt like he had a certain kind of knowledge to bring to bear, or, or at least understanding of the work, which was going to be helpful. And with Emer, I think, um, you know, I, I love her writing, her work, and in particular, um, I would say there's a kind of uh, an inhabitation of the body, which is very particular um, to, to Emer's writing. Um, so it, it feels like the body is kind of, I don't know, smashing up against the world in all sorts of ways, and that sort of act of everything, that sort of speaking body voice that she uses... Um, it feels like it feels it feels the world really clearly. So that was one aspect of her writing. But the other was that I had listened to, um, in fact, I think you're reading them, some of your work on audiobook during the pandemic, things I'd already read, but I started to listen to as I walked a lot, as we all did. And there was a rhythm and a refrain and a kind of... Um, particularly a sort of rhythmic quality to the to the phrasing and the syntax that somehow felt really like I got it and it made sense to me in terms of how I work even though I don't particularly use language or or um, narrative forms in any way so it was just kind of a, a gut feeling that that I would love to approach her um, and it felt quite scary to try and explain to her why so yeah how did that approach feel to you Emer? Um, well, I was, you know, alarmed to be asked, um, and uh, I was quite excited, but also thought, oh, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how to write about art. This is not something that I, it's not a world that I understand particularly, and uh, and so I was very keen, really, to find out what what did she mean exactly, and um, and so we, I think, we first met on Zoom which of course is not ideal for, especially sort of when you're trying to engage with art over Zoom and then art that is not yet made. <laughs> and, um, but it was, I think I felt quite quickly that there was some sort of similarity of energy that seemed to me to, once I understood that she wanted me to to write something that would be a more abstract response or a more visceral response rather than an intellectual response that suddenly seemed to make more sense to me and I felt that that was quite frightening and challenging but also impossible to refuse actually. Had you written about art before? I had had a little bit of experience I mean not uh, not in any sort of critical way but I had once been asked by Wolfgang Tillmans to write something for him, and also once for Sean Scully, there was a retrospective at the National Gallery in London. Excellent company. And it was, yeah, disparate, certainly. <laughs> um, but this, in a way, felt, you know, I think I'd known Wolfgang Tillman's work a lot, and it had been sort of quite useful for me, a lot of his early work with my own writing, just because of time and place and that kind of thing. But this felt like a more 
I don't want to, I don't want to say grown up, but it, it felt like a, a bigger challenge somehow, something because that was, was going writing. to ask something much more from me as a writer to engage with the kind of work that I couldn't take at face value. And it was what ha really helped was I was able to go and see some of Neve's work at an exhibition in Southampton. It was Southampton, wasn't it? And, and then suddenly I really felt, okay, I understand what is going on. I can't really say it and I wouldn't be able to intellectually explain it, but I felt in an abstract way I could find a language that would feel similar. Amazing. And Brian, for you, you already had an existing relationship with Neve in terms of knowing her practice quite intimately, uh, having written about it before. So this invitation came as no surprise. Um, I wouldn't say it came as no, no surprise, um, because it's Venice, you know? And so uh, it matters. Um, it matters to the artist and it matters to everybody, as we've heard um, uh, amazingly uh, today, to all the people uh, involved. And it's a huge challenge to try and write about somebody's work, first of all, as, as we've said, that's in the process of being made, but then also somehow to kind of write something that stands for all of your practice to date, which, which is in a way what, what Venice must, must feel like. Um, I had written this piece in, in um, early 2008, and that, it was one of the first um, invitations from an artist to write about their work, where, where we had, I had had the experience of going to your studio and actually spending time in the presence uh, of the work and it was at Fire Station Studios, and um, I was petrified, absolutely petrified, um, <laughs> because I realized, having sat there watching um, a video that I spent a lot of time writing about in that piece called Scotoma, which is amazing, um, that I had no questions to ask. I didn't know how to, uh, how to broach in language my, my response to this yet. Um, and it was that process of writing that piece was was almost like a, an education in itself in, in how you actually have a conversation with an artist um, about that sticks close to the work, as I was saying earlier, and somehow also does justice to all their other interests. I remember I went back and actually looked at the emails that we sent um, at that time recently. And the things that you were reading, um, uh, Pessoa and Walter Benjamin and stuff, and there's all this interesting stuff to do with um, proximity and distance, and visibility and invisibility. And I was really struck um, with the Venice invitation, how far things had moved from that work 15 years ago or so, but also how much of that was still present. And so that the challenge was somehow to, to write about objects rather than images um, and to, to see some kind of continuity but also kind of do justice to what was completely different um, uh, in the recent work. Even though I'd also kind of approached it, um, as Niamh says, as in, the, in the meantime, because there was a kind of period where we didn't see or, or hear from each other so much and I felt like I had enough distance to actually review a show of yours, um, I, to, to approach it with a slightly more detached, critical, um, uh, viewpoint. So I'd seen something in between, um, but it was still, you know, I felt like I'd missed out on a lot, I think. And so it, it felt quite difficult to approach. Yeah. Challenging. Well, you took that challenge very well. Um, Neve, do you think that there's a similar, uh, I, I mean, I think for people looking outside of a practice, getting to follow or watch as a curator, it's the absolute privilege that I have to get into a, 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 to get to accompany a practice of an artist for a prolonged period of time. And Brian, the way you describe your initial account, encounter with Neve's work as being largely focused on looking at and thinking about images and video, and then there being a gap and a sort of transition Neve into a realm that's more object-oriented, object-based. Is that something you can recognize in your own practice looking back on it? Or is that a trajectory that remains invisible to you as the artist? Well, maybe as I was saying earlier, you're forced to, you're forced to speak more and more as an artist, which is kind of a... Unquestionably. 
usual thing, actually, that whether artists should always be forced to speak. But anyway, um, but in doing so, you're kind of forced to narr narrativize your own sort of trajectory. I can't say anything, trajectory, um, which is, so you start to see links and to see why this might have happened or to spin a story yourself about why that happened. Um, so sometimes I don't know if I've just made that up because it's kind of tied it all to a nice, neat knot or whether, you know, the kind of, um, the, the one thing leading to another was actually so clean and, and, and logical, you know? It, or just it, a nice sound bite. Yeah, exactly. It is in retrospect, I suppose. I remember you saying to me as well before that you love working with writers because sometimes they give you the words that you later use to describe your work or you realise things about your work that you hadn't because of the words they use to articulate something, the essence of something. Yeah. I think that's a really interesting way to look at uh, working together with writers and collaborating in this way. But I think something that's different about the invitation you extended in particular to Emer, for example, was that it wasn't... Uh, to describe, to review, to articulate. It was to bring something of her own practice into the room. Can you talk a little bit about that? Likewise with Jenny Brady and her magnificent film, the idea of inviting somebody to sit alongside, to accompany, and to pay attention in a different kind of a way. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's um, it would feel... You know, when you're when the invitation is supposed to be an invitation, it's not supposed to be kind of like a demand. Do you know what I mean? So it's supposed to say, "I think you're brilliant. <laughs> I really like what you do. And um, do you want to do something in this big project we're doing? You know, kind of alongside, like parallel to this whole thing. Do you want to come with us on this journey?" So that's what I wanted the invitation to be. And I had this idea with Emer in particular that I kind of wanted to know what her kind of voice that, that is, is so insistent in her work would do when it hit up against an object that was slightly, because if you think of art, art objects as slightly existing outside of sort of known function or, or form, like slightly unnameable and um, kind of undefinable in their, in their thingness, like what would her kind of voice do when it met it, you know? So I was curious, but I hoped it would be I didn't want to put any sort of, you know, strong framework on it, which is also difficult because the brief is really too vague sometimes, I think, for people. So it's kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to give you this really open and kind of generous brief, but I'm also giving you no rules, which is a nightmare. Um, so I think people sort of react to that in different ways. And I with Lizzie as well, who's also in the book, you know, she, she um, I think she talks about the difficulty of that in her essay, you know, just kind of really irritated with them um, kind of being given no rules in a sense. Um, and with Jenny, I was thinking about this because people maybe ask you as an artist, you know, what art are you interested in? What do you look at? You know, what's in influencing your work? And, and it, for me, it's far broader than that. It's like films I see, it's books I read, it's it's a walk I take, it's, it's uh, you know, the day you have. And I kind of wanted to bring that sense of the breadth of what interests you in, in terms of forming a practice. So with Jenny, I thought, well, why can't we invite a filmmaker in the same way as we would an artist? So it's not, again, getting it to serve too tight a function, because there was talk about it like a documentary film. And I was like, I yeah, we can't do that as well <laughs> you know? and I can't answer questions all the way through about what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing yet so Jenny and myself took some trips during the um during the the sort of process of making physically making the work we went to the stone yard in Strab Valley and we went to the wood workshop um with Flan Hederman in Kilcock and she just hung out and we just spent like like a day in each place where she was just around and I was just doing what I was doing. And, and then I sent her loads of um, uh, foam videos I had of birds for no real reason, <laughs> apart from there seemed to be a lot of them <laughs> on my phone, <laughs> particularly during those last few years. So, so and that was it. And then I literally saw nothing until the end. But also I knew we talked about, we did have some meetings and we talked about sound in particular and we talked about how she uses sound so much. So in the same way as these guys use language and Jenny uses sound and I was like, well, that's that's their space. They hold that. My work is silent and has no language. So, so I can hand this over freely to these other amazing practitioners and see what they will do, how they will respond. Yeah. The way you do that seems to me to be quite curatorial in how you find affinities and bring them into your work, your space, your project, your practice. 
Um, one thing really important that I think it does as well is kind of dissolve or break the illusion of boundaries between disciplines that we so often have very rigid ideas about. You're bringing worlds of literature, of uh, filmmaking, all together, kind of clashing around together. And I love how you say your work is not, um, it doesn't have language, it doesn't have sound uh, always. It's, it's, that's not what it's kind of doing. And so you're bringing these other elements to bear. Neve, you spoke really beautifully at the start of today about your kind of artistic process, your artistic thinking, how you approach your work as an artist. Could I ask Brian and Emer, would you do the same for us and tell us about how you approach your work as writers? We know that Neve operates in a studio. We have a sense from everything we've seen and heard today about how she thinks and how she kind of gets into things and how you encounter and bond with ideas to make things. Can you tell us, is there any similarities in the world of being a writer and how does it feel and how do you approach your work? Um, there isn't a massive budget for a start. <laughs> it doesn't run to the hundreds of thousands. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, maybe I can describe... Maybe the place to start is, is actually with the kind of particularity of, uh, of this invitation. And I think that one of the things that's fundamental to my writing is the invitation or the commission and the mechanics, the logistics that go around that to do with deadlines, to do with um, space to fill. You know, may maybe that's a, a similarity in a way. There, there is literally a space to fill and there's a time by which it needs to be filled. And I know as a writer that I would never write anything whether you know art critical or literary critical or essayistic or autobiographical, whatever it, it might be, none of it would happen without that structure. And sometimes that structure is quite minimal. Somebody will say, "I've got this amount of money and I've got a deadline," you know, and you think, "Fine, I can do that." Um, and sometimes it's there's more, a lot more at stake, um, not just in scale because it's a book, let's say, but sometimes it's an essay for a publication that is more specialist, requires a particular kind of thinking about, well, who's the audience for this? If I'm writing about, let's say, an artist, um, I, one of the things I really like is writing about relatively obscure artists, writers, musicians, etc., for really mainstream publications. So you're, you're trying to work within constraints. Mm -hmm. You know that there are certain things you have to explain that you wouldn't have to explain, let's say, to an art audience or a or an academic audience, or uh, that kind of thing. So I suppose the starting point for me is constraint, um, and the sense that there is a kind of responsibility. And then the challenge is, first of all, to kind of find, so with something like um, Neve's invitation uh, for Venice, um, research is, in a way, the kind of first stage for me. I'm, I'm like amassing my materials, and I think, well, what, what are the materials here? There's the work itself. There's maybe a sort of constellation of, you know, books or films or thing, things that you might have discussed with, uh, with the artist. And then there's rabbit holes. There's like the crazy, half-formed, stupid thoughts that you have that you know make sort of sense, but, but you, you, you're wondering, should I risk this? And in the case of, 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 of this, the, the Venice work, the particular one that got me was the glass um, the glass that's in the canopy work, for example, which is based on uh, or refers to a kind of awning or canopy on, the, uh, on a street, but the glass itself, the decorative glass, is exactly the kind of glass that we're all familiar with in this country from uh, bathroom windows and porches. It's that kind of aspirational, smoked sometimes, uh, you know, with, with these kind of swirling patterns and so, or leaf patterns and so on. And I became, for, for several days, completely obsessed <laughs> with the history of this kind of glass. And I tracked down companies that made it and that still make it. And I found lists of the names that they give to these different kinds of decoration. And you have to, I think, kind of allow yourself those moments of, uh, you know, th this, maybe that's the entire essay. And then you think, no, actually, <laughs> Neva's ne going to kill me. And so I suppose you start with the, I start with the constraint and then the constraint gives me license to start thinking about really stupid things 
um, like who makes, you know, what, what, why is this glass called? I can't really even remember what they're called, but they autumn have really leaves. autumn leaves. <laughs> they have these very fanciful, fanciful sort of new agey uh, names. And then the next stage, and I'll, I'll shut up in, in one second, is to think how do how does this level of slightly free form research? It's not really research. Um, how does that then relate to a voice or a form that I can start to imagine actually getting on the on the page, if that makes sense? And and that's then when you you sort of think, okay, now now I'm doing something. It's not just I'm pottering about looking at you know glass videos on YouTube of like you know people making this stuff and. Because that will just go, f you can spend your life, you know, going down those holes. So that's the next stage is just thinking, okay, what's the form here? What's the structure? What's the kind of style or the voice that this thing should, should have? And then for the rest of the process, I think, that becomes the kind of driving thing. Because anybody can do research and anybody can have ideas. Uh, I think... Uh that's interesting to hear you talk because I think I'm almost the opposite in that uh, I, it, for me, the beginning is complete chaos, darkness, terror, horror. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know what's going to happen or if anything's going to happen. And, but all I know is I've been asked to do something and, and I would like to do it, so I'm going to try. And then, but there's no guarantee that anything will come of it in the end. And I did or no research on Need's work. You sent me some of your other books from other exhibitions, and I looked at those, um, but I tried not to read anything in them. I just looked at the pictures, and, and I thought about your email and what you had said in your email and what was interesting to you, and I thought, well, there are things that are interesting to me that sound similar, and... And then I, I just, what I wanted was nothing to interfere with the response. I just wanted to see what she showed me. So it, what she was able to show me on Zoom and then what I would, and listen to what she was describing, wh where she thought it was going, what it would be. And then going to see uh, the other exhibition, I think really helped because I suddenly, I began to feel what, where language could find a place inside of that, of how it might start to respond. And what I was really interested in was, despite the fact that obviously Neve has made objects, they are concrete, they exist, they are what they are, they don't change into other things, the choices that have been made and they exist, they still seem to me a kind of really un interesting unknowability about them, and a, a weird sort of flexibility inside a very concrete object. And that seemed the place where language could find somewhere like water moving in and out. And, it, and there was something, because the images and the, the objects are so strong, and yet at the same time there's a kind of a lack of insistence on themselves, where there's room for you to experience them and you're not being kind of told what your response is supposed to be. And I really, and that seemed very interesting to me, and that just seemed the place where language could start to respond. <clears throat> and that's, yeah, that was the beginning for me. It's amazing. Reaching but not grasping, I'm reminded of. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And so, and so it was <laughs> so it came that pass. a book was produced. <laughs> a really incredibly beautiful book that is full of these texts and images, but is also an object in itself. I know that you worked with the designer Alex Singh, the first 47, to make the book, but can you tell us a little bit about, first of all, the decision to make a book, what was the impetus behind that? And how did that come about? Yeah, I mean, I like books. <laughs> but also there's this idea that you're making, you're make, exhibitions are, are so short, even Venice, which is really long, you know, I mean, it's seven and a half months, I think, or something, and which is unusually long. But, you know, they, they have just this, this one moment of existence and then they're gone. And, and um, 
there's something there's something fabulous about a book and that it can have its own life and that it can be passed into many more hands and it can exist in a different way. And it's not the exhibition. And I'm not really interested in catalogues, you know, that purport to show you the whole show and explain it all and 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 there you go. You know, I, I kind of from the beginning I wanted the book to do something else, like to exist as a book in itself and to exist as something that can you can pick up in ten years time, I hope, and for it to still be of value or of you know interest at that point. Um, and there were certain decisions we made at the time actually when we were trying to get to grips with what the book would look like, um, the uh, book fair was on in Temple Bar, which is this event that happens um, every November, the, the kind of Temple Bar at Gallery and Studios book fair, <laughs> which has loads of artist books and, and it has all these tables with all these amazing publications laid, laid out. And myself and Michael were in it kind of in a winter evening, like lifting up books and going, ooh, we like this size and how does this feel in your hand? And I like this thickness and, you know, and, um, and then we were talking about that idea of, uh, I was thinking about books as a kid and when they were less, when it was really expensive to print in color. Um, which actually seemed to extend well into my 20s. It was impossible to print in colour. But, um, and that idea of a colour plate and that idea of, like, if you do have an image, let it be valuable within it. And so we, um, we had come across a book in, in the book fair that had some really high gloss pages. And we, after much research, found out that that had to be individually... You had to print the colour and then put a high gloss varnish over each colour page to get that effect. So this was an entire process. And we had to also to do with COVID and, and that shipping container incident. We had to order the paper for the book like months and months in advance. So we had to decide everything like for ages. And then with the texts, they had to be done so far in advance because they had to be translated into Italian. And that was a whole process because the book had to have Italian for that audience. So, you know, there was it, the book was huge project in and of itself and, and kind of kept extending into all the other parts. Um, but when we got the photographs, we photographed it. I think I came back on the Wednesday. Um, Ross Kavanagh turned those images around for the Friday. I went to Belfast and sat with Alex in his um, in his studio and we put that book together in like 36 hours I think and got it to the printers by Monday to get it in time for the opening in Venice so it was really intense and myself and Cleana mapped out the structure of the book on a napkin with some Campari spreads because I was Perfect. walking I was walking through Venice going I think I've got it I think I've got it it's got to open with the bird and end with the bird and Emer's text is the center fold in these se separate you know separate color pages and then you know and just and also we put like images of older work in, in black and white through the essays. And we had different images in the Italian essay and the English essay. And, you know, all of that had to be really, really considered. And we'd have all those images ready and lined up to go in. And so it was, it was a lot of preparation and then kind of just those intense hours sitting with Alex, who was amazingly patient and capable and fabulous. Incredible. So, yeah. At the risk of a little clumsiness, could we pass a, a copy of the book around? There's one in that bag there. <laughs> um, just for anyone who hasn't had a chance to kind of get their hands on it the and glossy have, have a flick through <laughs> and look at that glossy page that had to be varnished after being printed. <laughs> this is extreme stuff. <laughs> yeah, feel, have a good feel of the book now, please. <laughs> Books are part of your world, Neve. and as long as I've known you as an artist, I've always known you to be the person to ask, what are you reading? Because that's what I should be reading. <laughs> and the person to get books from. And I think literature has a huge influence on your practice, although it's not a writing practice. Can I ask you to talk a little about that too? I think I might be talking too much about the... Um, um, well, I don't know, maybe it's easier to have, uh, to, to, to have something that you... Um, I keep wanting to use the word affinity and I can't now, Brian, because it's just um, <laughs> ridiculous. Um, but, you know, that, that thing where um, it's easier to feel the, the, the parallels and without them being too close, you know. So I, I find it easier to, to enjoy everything from theatre and dance and music, and, and, but literature yeah, in particular, and, and to feel like I connect with it. Because if you, if you go to an exhibition and... I do, artists go to exhibitions and look at how things are made and how they're hung, and if they feel really close to their work, it feels really uncomfortable, you know? So it's not a, you know, it's, it's kind of a strange space. I go to see loads of exhibitions. I mean, I do it all the time, but I don't tend to feel 
influenced by it because I don't, um, I don't want to set myself up kind of in relation to all those different practices. Like that's some sort of like game or something that we're all playing, knocking off against mm -hmm. each other. You know, that seems too, um, too much about positioning or something, you know? So I, I look at work because I like looking at work. But in terms of the things that resonate in the studio, it tends to be different forms, yeah, and often, often language. And Emer and Brian, can I ask both of you, what's your relationship to exhibitions um, in terms of inhabiting a world of writing? When you see an exhibition, do you look at the nuts and bolts of how it's made, as Neve described, an artist might? Or do you think about it in different terms? Is it, is it always exhibition specific? Or are there always kind of words in the back of your mind describing what you're seeing? No, and I, I, I think my writing works the way it does because I don't think in words at all. I, I think mostly in images. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, I really uh, I understand what Neve says. Uh, in terms of for me for writing, I find it very hard to read when I'm writing. Because either I think it's great and I start to imitate it, or I think it's terrible and infuriates me that this exists in the world. <laughs> um, and it, it, you do end up feeling like you get trapped in some kind of Olympics of literature where you're watching what everyone's doing and measuring. And, and, and so actually going to an exhibition or engaging with a different form is a release and is in fact often much more creatively stimulating for me than reading a book because it's far enough away that I'm not looking about, I'm not interested in the nuts and bolts because I know I don't understand how that gets made and there's no way, there's no point in me working out how that gets made because it's not like I'm going to do it. Um, it's all a bit me, me, me really, but, <laughs> but I am a novelist, so there you go, that's what happens. Um, but yes, yeah, so often, so for me, writing, my office is not, I have some books in it, but really I have a lot of pictures um, because that is, that for me works better and often, and music as well. I, I find music very useful for writing because again, it's something that I cannot do, can't do any, can't even sing a note and, and actually it helps to open up things inside me. So uh, going to exhibitions, I'm always looking for the things that just open open you in some strange way. And I think that's why, for instance, being asked to then write something in response to Neve's work is so terrifying because at the same time, you worry that what if I, what if I got it wrong? What if I didn't understand it the way that she wanted me to understand it? What if, and so that, the moment of having to deliver the manuscript and go, and here it is, is so awful because you, you know, you, you want to have understood because you feel there is something, there is an affinity. Yeah. Um, and, and you want to, to do right by that and to, to make a place, to earn your place in something like uh, this grand project, which is so epic and you know is such a huge undertaking for Neve and for everyone involved, and to be worthy of being part of that and to not kind of give her something and then she goes, oh, <laughs> thanks so much for that. Um, funny, the book is getting smaller, there's no room. <laughs> you know, that's sort of the horror of, of what if I didn't understand correctly. Um, because, you know, if I was reading a book, it's easy for me to understand if I'm understanding. But you're trying to work through a different creative means. That's quite frightening to do. Neve, did you go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got back to you quite quickly. I think you did, yes. Because I Mercifully. kind of know that the person needs you to get back to them quite quickly. But one thing I did do with your text almost immediately when I got it, I was sitting in the studio and I read it out loud to myself. Because I don't know, it just, it just com totally compelled you to do that. And then I actually sent it to a couple of, I sent it to Michael and Kleena, obviously. And um, I sent it to a couple of friends, including you, Kate, yeah. I think. And I said, here, read this, but read it out loud. <laughs> um, so I don't know if I told you that, but that, that was an immediate effect that it had on, on me. It was like it needed to be spoken. 
So I would say to anyone who buys the book, read it out loud. <laughs> And Brian, for you, with the writing practice that's so proximate to art and with the book Affinities where you're speaking about images and I love that you said love. Can you talk to us a bit in terms of that? Um, well, I might work around to love, but um, I, I think I said earlier um, that I never quite know what to ask an artist, especially in studio visit situation. And in those moments, the, the question that I end up blurting out always is, and what's this one made of? Um, <laughs> and actually, if, if you're that naive, um, you learn an awful lot by, by just blurting that question out over and over again. Um, but because I, I've curated a couple of exhibitions, um, and because I have asked that question uh, to artists a lot, I do now pay attention um, to what things are made of, and I, and I pay close attention to the lists of materials. You know, I. I I want to know what jesmonite is. You know, for ages you'd see it in a list and you think, what, what the it? hell is this stuff? Now I know. Um, and that is, there's something immensely important about, um, that, that does actually affect how you, how you write, not just how you write about uh, artworks, but how you think about materials. And so I've learned, I think, a, a lot from that initial naivety. But I think that probably the main thing that I've learned from artists that I'm able to think about or apply in my own writing, it's kind of structural, and, it, and it's to do with, I think I've learned this from curators as well as artists, and it's to do very simply with asking yourself the question, what happens if I put this thing alongside this other thing? Whether it's this form alongside this form, this color alongside that color, this word alongside that word. And um, sometimes, I mean, I write mostly what you might call essays, and the essay in a way is a kind of curatorial form, um, or a kind of form of collage. And often when I'm writing, I feel nervous about simply putting one thing alongside another. I think there's the kind of writerly brain comes in and asking, well, what's the transition, Brian? What's the argument, Brian? And actually, sometimes what you want is simply to put one thing alongside the other thing because something happens in between. Mm. And I think that's probably the fundamental thing that I've learned, not just from looking at art, from, but from talking to artists and talking to curators and talking to people who work in a space, setting one thing alongside another. Amazing, thank you. It's lovely that you mention the lists of materials and how important they are in, in your reading or interpretation of a work or reflection upon or response to. Because Neve, one thing you constantly evade is titling, although you do name your work. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the process of naming? <laughs> when you have to put words yeah, the well, I mean, untitled is just terrible, right? I mean, just saying untitled is just, it's just bad. And also, you do name them when you're working with them, even if it's just to talk about them to somebody who's helping you make it. So, you know, you're kind of, you know, the, you know, the, the, the drain piece, you know, is, is what we were constantly referring to that piece as. So when it came to it, and, and it, you know, it was, it was going to be called drain because it was just what it was, you know, what it was called. And often the words are, are useful, single words are quite useful because they seem to open up more than sentences or than phrases, you know, which seem more kind of leading in their, in their um, particularness. You know, they, they're kind of suggesting or directing something. So, so yeah, I've said I name, I mean, I title essentially, but I tend to use one word or two words which are quite clearly descriptive and um, the right thing to call that object. Um, that feels like enough. But I do, I do care about the list of materials. Like they have to be true and, and enough. And like there's a piece, um, there's a couple of pieces uh, in Tampa Bar that are, are made of, there's a new piece made of limestone and the limestone has all been flamed, which is a process where they run a very hot flame over the top of the limestone after it's cut and shaped. And it kind of, um, like lots of slivers of stone just kind of burst off it and it creates this kind of roughening texture. And even though that's just written as flamed limestone, I've put that term, you know, that word in there. It's true, it's just descriptive of the process, but I've also put fire into the, 
into the suggestion of, you know, within that titling. But I do really, um, we had somebody respond to the show in Sligo and they didn't notice the, the titles because the titles are quite discreet and they're on the wall and they're on a map and that's absolutely fine with me because I think that you can seek them out and they'll, they'll but they're not going to kind of answer anything because the work isn't there to be a big, you know, it's not a big puzzle to be solved. There isn't a, there isn't a clear kind of, you know, response that you need to have. So they're there, but they're not kind of in your face. You're not required to walk around the room with this list in your hand and like figure it out like it's some sort of treasure map, you know, like this will help you. <laughs> because I would like the works to just be able to just kind of exist in the room and be enough without the language as well. Thank you. They're like invitations or offerings, I guess, in a way. And so now I would like to invite you, <laughs> if you have any questions for Neve or Brian or Ema or myself, I think it's about that time of the day that we should open it to the floor. Hi. Um, just talking about words, I was just wondering about the title. Um, oh, Gather. Yeah. Okay. Good question. <laughs> I had a really long list on a page. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but it did feel like, um, again, we had to come up with that really early because we had to have a title. I mean, you know, you just get asked, again, you get asked the wrong questions at the wrong time. You know, what is the title of your exhibition six months before you make it? And you're just like, um, but, it, you know, we were thinking a lot about the fact that this would be, at that point, we were like, okay, COVID will definitely be over by then. You know, we'll all be able to, act. Venice will happen and we'll be able to go and there'll be an exhibition and we'll be able to gather. And so that word felt, it felt both like an invitation, you know, come gather, hopefully. And also there was... At that point, you know, the, the, the sense of, of people gathering was, was kind of ominous and sort of scary. And, the, you know, there's an increasing amount of people gathering on the streets for good reason, for lots of different reasons politically. There is, you know, so it was like, is this, a, is this a kind of, you know, directive? Is this a command? It's very much like how I'm titling the works, to yeah. be honest. Like a term that can mean a lot and that can mean something quite soft and open or it can mean something quite kind of curt. And, uh, and directive. So it, it felt like it could speak to all of those things that we were feeling and the complications of what this exhibition might be. And it's been very useful because we've been able to just put a venue beside each thing. So it's Gather Dublin, Gather Sligo. <laughs> so it's worked out. So despite the fact that you had to arrive at it kind of almost prematurely, you've fallen in love with it. Yeah, and I kind of realized as well that it was sort of what, it's almost what Brian was saying, that putting things, one thing beside another, I realized that that's actually how you make work. Mm. You, know, you literally gather elements and you place them beside each other. And that was another thing that felt, that helped it feel like a really appropriate word. Yeah. Great. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Um, I'm interested, Brian spoke a little bit about how writing this piece uh, had a relationship with Affinities, the book that you've just published. I wonder, Emer, if there was like, that you found that there was a relationship between what you were working on um, in, in your sort of wider practice and, and what you wrote for, for Neve, or if there's a kind of reflexivity. Yeah, I mean, I think it was interesting that I, I felt, despite having a remit to sit down and write, it felt more like starting a novel than a lot of other commissioned work that I've done, where I feel like, okay, this is this, is this thing, and I'm going to focus on that, and that's how I start. Whereas with this, it did feel more like that sense of it begins when you write the first word, and you don't know what the next word will be until you finish writing the first word and feeling my way through it. And it, that was unusual for me to have a, that experience of a commissioned work as opposed to a novel. Um, and, but I think that was to do with that feeling of Neve's work 
isn't, doesn't offer an explanation and isn't asking for an explanation. And that's very close for me in, in terms of what I want for my, with my, my fiction is that it is, I'm not here to explain what this is. I am here to invite you into the experience of this thing that this character is going through. And, and so that did feel very similar to me in the way that surprised me, actually. Thank you for a lovely question. Um, are there any more questions? And do any of you have questions for each other? <coughs> I mean, I'm, I'm afraid to ask this one because, and I'm not looking for you to go, oh, it was great. Um, but <laughs> you finally got to see the work, both of you. Did you kind of go? Because, <laughs> I mean, Imre, you came to the opening, which was amazing. And, and Brian, you went a month later, I think, um, to Venice. Um, but did you go, oh, oh, it's smaller than I thought, or it's, it's um, slightly different than I imagined it? Um, I think I thought something that maybe, maybe this is something that Where's Lizzie... Microphone? Sorry, maybe this is something that, that Lizzie, um, again, too relaxed. <laughs> um, I, I thought something that I think Lizzie talks about in her essay, um, and, and we, should, we should remind ourselves before we, we, we finish today about how great Lizzie Lloyd's uh, essay is. Um, and that's to do with a kind of anthropomorphic quality um, in the work. And you, you, know, you had sent me many images of the work we'd, we'd talked, we had long Zoom calls, etc. I was familiar with related work um, from the John Hansard show. Um, and I still had not predicted what it felt like to stand in front of some of those works and look up at them and feel yourself slightly <laughs> dominated by them, slightly kind of elevated by them. Just, just that sense of like that you were in the presence of something that I'd thought long and hard or tried about materials but I had not thought about those materials in a kind of bodily sense. So I was thinking about you know, the, the beautifully finished uh, wooden pieces relating to you know, furniture and decor and so on. And I'd failed entirely to think this is actually a sort of spine. You know, this, is, this is something bodily. And so that, that was the main thing, I think, that I came away with, as well as, of course, that just that sense of the kind of openness of that space that other people have described? Um, for me, it was, I mean, because I saw it on the, on the opening morning, and so it was really rammed with people, and it was quite overwhelming. And, you know, also because my life is, I sit alone in a room all day long, and then also the pandemic, so it was still, oh, people. Here we are, humanity, and and I and I thought, oh no, this is I'm going to feel like I can't look at anything properly because I've got all this kind of ooh, people are everywhere, and what really struck me was that the work sort of overcame it, which was really beautiful, and I hadn't. As soon as I just said, oh, just shut up and come down, just look, and it it really sort of. It just overcame everything else that was going on around it. And that was really wonderful to just kind of stand there and think, ah, yeah, this is, this is what I thought it was going to be. But it feels more. And it, feel, it felt really emotional to go and to stand. And I really didn't want to go. And I kept trying to leave, but then just kept coming back and having just one more. I'll just have one more walk around, despite all these people are driving me crazy. But... <laughs> but it, I didn't want to leave it. And it just, it was, I don't know, it was such a wonderful thing to feel, to have been part of it and to just, to know more than I would ever normally know as well about how that work came about, to be on the inside of, of, of how that came to be made. And then to see it finally there was really a kind of wonderful, wonderful experience actually. Thanks, guys. I, I, just in relation to the crowds, I was just thinking about one thing while you were talking, is that some of the pavilions, it was difficult for us because we, we had like an entrance and an exit. Like we, we were kind of a thoroughfare in a sense, but some of the pavilions control their numbers. 
And I, I understood why. In fact, like the Italian pavilion, which was the biggest space in the entire arsenal, they only let like one person in at a time so that you would almost be on your own in this vast room and it was part of the work. And we couldn't do it, but we also didn't want to do it. We were, we, you know, we didn't want to do that thing of going, you know, five at a time and you have to spend this amount of determined time in there and then you leave and kind of, con you know, control and choreograph people to that extent. But um, I found that, you know, I found it totally overwhelming to be in that space with a lot of people. I find it almost like, you know, and also we were terrified of the work <laughs> and, you know, backpacks and glass and dripping umbrellas when it would pour drain. And it was just, um, but there was also, you know, no perfect. I realized after a while, I was like, well, you know, how do I want it? What's the right amount of number in the you know, number of people in the room if I could control this? And I was like, no, you, can, you know, you have to just let, you have to just hope that they can hold their own, you know, in, in whatever craziness Venice will bring. And it really did bring a lot of people through in a really yeah. kind of mad way. It's not normal. It's not a normal experience of looking at an exhibition. And it's one of the other kind of crazy things that you're up against there. I love how Lizzie, I, I love how Emer put it when you said the work overcame everything that was going on around it. Yeah, and, I mean, it really did. And, and you could see it happening to people as yeah. they were going around wow. it as well, because I was looking at other people after I had sort of done it myself. I started to look at other people looking. And you could see that there was a kind of like, oh, elbows and people and everything. And then something would happen and you would, could just see people kind of going, oh, uh -huh. here is this, here, here it is. This is why we're here. And this is, I'm having an experience with this. And that was was very profound, actually, I thought. And, and just to be, I'm really glad now that I did see it in that very cha chaotic way because it, you could feel the power of the work, the mm. way it just, it refused to be overwhelmed by what was going on around it. It just took over as it, you know, like we should. Amazing. If we have no more questions, I would say a quick word of thanks before we move out and uh, enjoy some delicious Italian spritz. <laughs> Does anybody have a last question that they'd like to ask? Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask Neve about the relationship between, let's say, the tactile and the digital in your work. Um, you know, we were talking about people engaging, wanting to engage tacitly with the work um, and I'm just wondering about your decision to put let's say those videos the digital videos beside certain objects and kind of and you talked a bit about that was a way of kind of arresting people and getting them to slow down and engage so is that always or is that a big way that you would use the digital or are you you know to kind of choreograph in a way how long people are spending there or or do you ever worry that it's kind of a, a clash between the digital and the, the tactile, the engagement, that it's detracting. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I've made quite a lot of moving image works over the years, and in the earlier ones were all projections because that was the technology, in a way, that was available at the time, you know, if you wanted to have any scale or kind of... And I was projecting onto surfaces that were either um, maybe had, like, a stretch black cloth or they had a... Um, they had a painted surface, so they, I was always really interested in kind of holding the light onto something physical and it being somehow solid rather than simply, you know, kind of um, light, um, sort of hitting a screen with slightly, with not enough kind of quality and, and depth really, you know, being kind of unsatisfying. Um, and I became less and less interested because I wasn't making works which were functioning in any clear narrative form. I became less interested in a theatrical kind of cinema space for viewing moving image. So I started to use screens, and I was kind of interested in how they could sit alongside sculptures and somehow inhabit a similar physical plane as the sculptures. So that became, that was kind of where it went. And with the LED, um, I mean, it was partly budget that allowed me to use them because they're not that easy to, you know, be able to afford to use them in, in, a, in an exhibition. But I really liked the fact that the they're made up of tiny little bulbs, which are literally, you know, turned on and holding the image, like in a, in a physical form that's very visible. 
and we deliberately left um, the reverse of all of those LED screens open so that you can see all of the kind of whirring machinery, which seems obscene, actually. There's so much of it. It's like, you know, loads of cabling and lighting and flashing little lights and all of that. And I kind of wanted the, the sort of... Um, I wanted that mechanism, that sort of uh, engineering, that sort of uh, physical structure that's necessary to produce an image to be part of the sculptural work of the show. Like how much of the, how much is necessary to make this picture of something which isn't even the thing itself, you know? I had a lovely response from somebody in the exhibition on, on those opening days who came up and said, is all that necessary to make the vent work? And I was like, well... Yes, <laughs> you know, but you know, and I didn't really, you know, I did eventually say it, it's an image, <laughs> you know, of event, um, and it felt like, but that felt kind of important, like it felt like that was speaking to something as well about how our image world functions and how, you know, the, the how it kind of images are everywhere and they sort of lose their impact or we forget how they're produced or the energy, you know, the, the kind of mechanisms behind their production and it felt. Like if I was going to put one in the space, it had to be, it had to own all that and be obvious in its physicality. Thank you. Thank you. So now I'm going to say thank you. And uh, before we step out for refreshments, I'm going to thank Anne McCarthy of Mayo County Council, Mayo Arts Officer Anne-Marie McGinn, Austin Vaughan of Mayo Creative Ireland, the wonderful staff here at the Linen Hall, with Bernie, Sean, Ray, thank you so much, the whole extended team, the good people of Castle Books who are out in the foyer, and of course, the Arts Council supporters of the Irish Tour. Uh, sincere thanks to everyone who spoke today, with words or through work. Thanks to Neve, to Cleana, to Michael, to Russ, to Jenny, to Alex, to Brian, to Emer, and most of all, to each and every one of you who came and sat and listened and thought together with us. Artworks without audiences, I like to think, are just things in a room. <laughs> and it's actually the audience who breathes life into them. So thanks for doing that with us today and enjoy the spritz. Thanks, thanks, Lee. <laughs>